and it's your boys Roshan Gomez, Jeremy Lim. What's up? <laughs> I always laugh at that. I don't know why. I just yeah. find I think it's still surreal that we we do this every week. <laughs> <laughs> so every time you say what's up, I'm like oh, this is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and today in the house we have the beautiful badass, the 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 legend that is Miss Colleen Augustine. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um. I mean, we were talking before the podcast started, and we already mm. covered a few interesting topics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should have we should have pre-recorded this <laughs> coming on. <laughs> bloopers, bloopers. Yeah. yeah, we should have though. We're thinking of doing like a Patreon sort of account, <laughs> and then like you, you can pay for the pre <laughs> pre discussion. <laughs> we're just gonna leave a recorder here, not edited. You can just <laughs> listen to the raw files. <laughs> like Trevor Noah's in between the scenes. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I've never yeah. seen that. I have, I have. What is it? Like, it's just a vlog. Is it the kind of vlog stuff? Or? No, it's like um, between his segments, you know, they're doing the makeup and everything. But like, oh. while they are in the transition, then he's talking to the crowd. Oh, okay. You know, it's just an like in-between. Uh, it's fun. It feels like a bit of a mini. He gives like a little lecture. He does because I think it depends on what the topics the audience starts to ask him. Uh, yeah, they ask questions, right? Yeah, sometimes hmm. they ask him like, there was a few. Oh, it sometimes talks to his guests sometimes, mm. like Anna Kendrick. Sometimes yeah. he talks to them, but the guests sometimes they ask like quite weird questions. So it <laughs> it depends what kind of questions they ask. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember one that I thought was interesting. He was during the World Cup, and I think the f- French had won. Oh my god! <laughs> won? They had won. When, yeah. when would that be? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> French haven't won anything in a while. <laughs> like I said, like I was, we were telling Colleen, because like, Colleen is her background right now is fighting, and yeah. me and Jeremy have uh, almost, minimum <laughs> almost zero, almost yeah. zero. <laughs> Last week we had Kash Kashika uh, on, and she's a footballer. Oh uh, wow! Again, we have. <laughs> 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 ask me about Batman. Don't ask me. About yeah. <laughs> Geek culture, board games, we can do. Yeah. <laughs> fighting, football, cars, mm. uh. <laughs> or oh, cars. Yeah. No. So again, I don't know. I think it's the. F- I think the front. I think France won, <laughs> and but basically what happened was I think Trevor Noah in a previous episode had said that this was a win for Africa as well, because yeah. there were a lot of um, black players on the black team. players mm-hmm. on the team. Okay, and so I think the French ambassador mm-hmm. wrote a letter to him, <laughs> and I think it was funny because he did the accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not gonna try and like oh. mimic it here, but <laughs> and he, I think he was just having a discussion lah, and um, I mean you can agree or disagree, but it was funny lah. <laughs> Yeah, again, thank you so much for coming on, Colleen. Thank you for inviting me though. Yeah. All people. Very <laughs> surprised. <laughs> because we don't know each other really well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know your dad. Yes. Uh, true church. Uh, a very cool guy. Very, uh, very. Yeah. Good teacher as well. Yeah. Do you think you're… Okay, so uh, before we get into that, uh, maybe you can introduce yourself. Let's start there. Um, so I guess like I am… Well, currently I am… Uh, MMA fighter, amateur MMA fighter. Mm. So, to those who are listening, amateur and professional, the only difference is that one we get paid, one we don't. Mm. So, I'm an amateur uh, MMA fighter right now. So, I only fight in amateur tournaments and all that. It's a bit safer than professional as well for the time being. Why is it safer? Uh, You have shin pads, you have gloves, and the rule sets are a bit different. Whereas in professional, you have elbows. Hence why (laughs) getting paid is really good when it comes to all these things. Yeah, because you need to pay for your medical. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Your insurance premiums must be extremely high. I have a lot. uh, My parents actually do cover insurance for me. (laughs) But they do not cover… None of my insurance actually covers me getting injured in the fight. Because they say like… Because they say like, you're putting yourself there. So why should we cover you? I'm like, but you cover other sports like running and (laughs) and all that when they compete. Yeah, yeah. And they still like, oh, it's fine. But then in MMA, it's like, no, because you're putting yourself to get beat up in the first place. It's not like it's it's not like you're a Brad Pitt in Fight Club. (laughs) 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 It's not. You're not going around like Bruce Lee and fighting (laughs) on the streets. You're going for a tournament. (laughs) Because they don't see MMA as a sport. Like Ah. literally, this is such a big issue Mm. because. I understand where people are coming from. And literally, uh, MASMA, the Malaysian Association of Malaysia, mm. the MMA Association, we, during MCO, uh, they were having a lot of uh, live. So every Monday, they will have different guests on different topics and stuff like that. Okay. And I was quite blessed. Um, the president actually asked me to be part of one of the discussions. And one of the discussions was, is MMA a sport? Okay. Mm. And I came from a fighter's point of view. 
to speak about what I saw MMA as. And then we had the journalist's point of view, mm. a referee's point of view, a coach's point of view. And of course, like a regular person who was watching and stuff like that. Mm. So you had points of views from different people, how they see the sport, especially those that have been there for a long time. And it, it's and you even have people actually in the MMA commission in IMAF, which is the tournament I fought last year in. And even her talking about her experience and stuff like that. And in the end, honestly, MMA is a sport. But the reason why people don't see it that way is because MMA kind of came from a professional point of view first. Meaning, you get paid to fight, and then it digressed to having amateur fights, semi-pro fights, to build up that that like kind of like roster of fighters to go into a professional scene. Mm. So because I feel like it started off as a professional thing where you get paid to fight, it was more <laughs> of a blood spot. MMA mm. fighting was like in the back backyard. Everyone just beating the shit out of each other. Even UFC 1, there was no weight classes. It was just a bunch of different people from different martial arts backgrounds coming together and fighting each other and see which martial art was the best. Mm. And you had a 100 kilo guy fighting 50 kilos. Mm. A guy who's 50 kilos. Like uh, uh, one of the Gracie family. I, I'm really bad at names. Gracie family it's is jiu-jitsu. the jiu-jitsu family, and right? his yeah. father told him… He's not, sm- he's not a big guy as well. His father told him, you're not allowed to strike. You can only do jujitsu to show them that jujitsu works. That's crazy. <laughs> and he, he won. He won. He won. But, but it was That's cra- crazy. He, he was crazy because, like, I'm not sure which UFC, but he actually won, and wow. he's not very big. And his father told him because I don't want you to become like them, just punching people. Show them that jujitsu actually works. Mm. Was it UFC or was it the uh, Jap- the Japanese U- one? Because I there's think it's rising. No, there's a there's another one that started earlier than UFC. Yeah, yeah. I one. think it could be that one, but then. UFC covers it also, so I wasn't sure. Oh, okay. The history. Right. I'm very vague on the history timeline. Yeah. I have okay. To okay. Admit. And it was interesting because you have all this. I find it insane because the fights didn't have a time limit, mm. so it was who got knocked out first or <laughs> went to sleep first. Yeah. And you had five nights, five fights in a row at night. <laughs> I fought five days in a row, and I could feel it. I cannot imagine fighting five fights in a row in one whole night. That's insane. It, th- to me, that really… It has a similar feel of like… Uh, you know, putting dogs in a pen and getting them mm. to fight I each mean, other. I that's it's where it that started. Brutal. Like gladiators. Yeah, Spartans gladiators, fighting. Yeah. Essentially, that was kind of the concept of yeah. MMA where you yeah. pin two people. <laughs> no, it's I, a blood spot. That's yeah. why people don't see it as a actual sport. Because mm. they say it's a blood spot. Yeah, I can imagine like… This is like two guys like… Bro, all <laughs> these are rules are bullshit. <laughs> 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 just… just Take it all out. Two guys, you know, in the box, no rules. <laughs> <laughs> then I mean, they start getting like brain damage. No, the worst yeah. would no. probably be the drugs. Yeah, because oh. if you if you had no restriction on how much drugs they could take, uh, yes. they would all be taking it. And definitely. Then <laughs> yeah, definitely. In MMA scenes, when there's no regulation, there are people taking steroids. You, you take one look at them, you know, like, you on something, bro. Yeah. Okay, but the <laughs> steroids discussion is an interesting discussion. Yes. I feel like we are jumping w- way too fast. <laughs> we normally go where a lot of places, but we we are going really really quick with this <laughs> one. Okay, let, let's take it back. A bit. Let's take, take it back. Sure. Um, okay, so okay. okay. <laughs> um, how do you go into it? Is it no? Okay, maybe we can do that. You mm-hmm. saying that whether it's a real sport or not? Yeah, sport or entertainment. Yeah, because I think with MMA, what people don't know is it's relatively new. It's not uh, the last 20 years, you'd say? Yeah. Yeah. When I was… Because I remember UFC was in nine, late 90s. Mm. So, that was around when I was born. Which, so. which is relatively new when you compare it to sports like boxing, for example. Yes, definitely. And things like that. Um, but it's also not super new because you, in the Greek, Roman Greek time, when you have Olympics, you had pancreation, mm. which was very similar to MMA. Mm, mm, mm. I, but I guess another problem is that we grew up with WWF. I have no, a I feeling like you know for a lot <laughs> no, of time no. for a lot of for a lot of people <laughs> when you spoke about wrestling uh, they thought you know, is that yeah yeah, yeah I have I've seen the difference yeah oh my goodness <laughs> do you all know why they changed the name from WWF to WWE no idea do you know because it's not it's not a prof it's not a pro thing <laughs> like, no it's, because it's, that's what they consider pro wrestling uh, wait what what because WWF the environmental oh. agency sued oh. them sued them. <laughs> and then they had to change the name to WWE. 
could have just paid them for the name. But but, but the, yeah, actually. But the thing is, a lot of people grew up with like that sort of like, oh, fighting That's is the background. fake. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's entertainment. Mm. And I guess when MMA came, I think MMA was almost a bit of a reaction to that as it's, well. It's a inter- it, Don't get me wrong. It is entertaining to watch MMA. Why do you think even mm. in the olden days, people were pinning two gladiators against each other? People love watching that. It, it is as it is. So, hence why there was a, is this entertainment or, you know, I are you being paid to be an entertainer or <laughs> as an athlete? Mm. So, don't get me wrong. Pro wrestling is very much scripted. But, <laughs> also, you do need to be very athletic in order to do those stunts. Mm. Yeah. So, yes, it's highly entertain is entertainment because it's performing based. But, it, they are also athletes in okay, a way or another. Th- this is very interesting. Because I think uh, there are maybe percentages. So, with WWF, <clears throat> like you talk about The Rock, for example. Yes. He's an entertainer first. Yes. But his uh, entertainment as an actor is supported by his um, a- athletic ability. Of course. Right? Um, but you contrast that, for example, with uh, Usain Bolt. Mm-hmm. He's a runner first. He's an athlete first. Yes. And the entertainment comes later. That is very true. I that know. is very true. I'm not sure how entertaining running can really be. Though. Usain Bolt though? Dude, remember how was it the hype? It w- I think it was an interesting hype phenomenon. I don't think it was entertaining to watch. I don't know. Yeah, but I, just, I guess what I'm saying is like you can be entertained by an athlete. Okay, yeah. You know, it's like a… Um, Watching a nat- mastery kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like it's a natural sort of like… Yeah, I can I can get yeah. that. But he's he's not an entertainer first. He's an yes. athlete first. That is very then true. entertainer. Very true. But you contrast that with The Rock, for example, or even all those guys. Those yeah. What those guys do is difficult. Yes. And they can get really, really hurt as very well. Very much. Hmm. But it's entertainment first. Yes. And then it's… Uh, yes, athlete. very true. Mm. Which gives people a lot of <clears throat> misconception. Because… When I say I do wrestling, they're like, <laughs> oh, like, <clears throat> like MPW. Mm. And I'm like, no. Sorry, what's MPW? MPW is Malaysian Pro Wrestling. Like our version of WWE. Yes, we have. Oh. We have? Oh, huge scene. So there's MMA fighter <laughs> AJ Pyro. Okay. He used to do that before really like going into professional MMA. And there was probably more money in it, right? In MPW? Definitely. Like yeah. this MPW has been going on much longer. It's a bigger scene than MMA in Malaysia. 100%. Mm. And uh, WWE, all these things in each country has their own version. Mm. And it's huge because it's entertainment. <laughs> People pay to watch these things. Yeah. And because it's just entertainment, it's easy for everybody to understand. Yeah. Mm. And it's a lot, there's a common. lot of drama. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Everyone loves drama. Yeah. Everyone loves having that. And you don't need to have any knowledge whatsoever mm. to watch and be entertained or love it. Mm-hmm. It's not like MMA where you watch a fight and sometimes you really don't… Uh, people who don't do martial arts or don't really watch it, they do not comprehend what's going on. Mm. They're like, what's happening? Yeah. So that's where it comes the difference. But I find it very funny because it's like wrestling. Oh, like, uh, w, like MPW. And I was like, no. Like wrestling as in like… You know the American NCAA wrestling in a ring? Like yeah. the, in a circle on mats? That kind of wrestling where maybe, we literally maybe, throw each other around. Maybe if you say Conor McGregor or something like that, they'll understand. No, but Conor McGregor does not wrestle very much. If you've seen his fights… I mean, He doesn't. But he actually has very good wrestling. He just doesn't oh. use it in his fights. Because mm. as an MMA fighter, you need to be all-rounded. You have yeah, to yeah. learn everything. You can't just… Um, oh, good. I, oh, I'm good in Muay Thai. I'm just going to go into an MMA fight and just strike. That's not going to happen. But they know the base. They know what to do. The only thing is they just prefer to strike or they prefer to grapple. Mm. So like if you see Conor McGregor, even when he fights, he's because he started off as a boxer. Yeah. So his hands are solid. So if you know that's your strong suit… He started off as a boxer? Yeah. Oh, so that's why he going back into boxing, he had that big uh, uh, yeah. uh, Mayweather. Mayweather fight, right? So then it wouldn't be… I thought he was like, he never like boxed. And no, then he started he, no. off as a boxer. Oh, so he used to boxing first. Uh, but he he loved MMA and he he was good at it. Because yeah. you talk about different sports, right? And you can you can be good at like let's say um let's say like you there's Muay Thai boxing, Jiu Jitsu wrestling. You might be good in that sport, but sometimes uh someone else might really be much better. Because either it's just more natural for them or they really like… All they do is that. And MMA comes into play where you you come up with like a rojak 
of mm-hmm. different all the different sports and you put together. And that's a whole different sport on its own because you have to be good at merging everything together. You need to be fluent in being able to strike, to grapple, to grapple, to strike. You need to be able to flow so smoothly. And if you see Conor McGregor when he fights, he has good wrestling uh, defense. Whenever people try to take him down, he has a beautiful sprawl. He knows what to do. It's just that he doesn't prefer it in his fights. Conor McGregor is the only one that... Not only one, but he's someone who... Okay, athlete first. But his entertainment is really high. Because he's smart. Yeah. MMA, <laughs> when it comes to professional scene... Okay, amateur professional scene. If you want people to watch, you need to be entertaining. Hmm. Sad to say, even though it is a sport on its own. But if you want to make big bucks in mm. the professional scene, you need to do what he does. Mm. Be entertaining. So people love watching you. And that's why he knew that was the key to make sure he was successful. Mm. Was to be entertaining. So people would pay to watch him. Because mm, mm, mm. who is the majority of people going to pay money to watch <laughs> UFC fights? Mm. It's regular people. The commercial aspect. Right? Yes. Actually, I spent the whole night yesterday watching YouTube videos. Uh, wow. Have you all ever watched uh, Two Set Violin? Have you all ever watched? No. no. It's these two like... Um, young Chinese um, guys who uh, study classical music. They're okay. violinists, Ooh, basically. Wow. And so they just like review other people playing the violin. You know, like like uh, in movies. Or, or, okay. or, or, oh, Lord. Or, and, and they're really, really funny. It's really, really entertaining. Their, their videos are quite good. They got like maybe, on average, you can even hit like 1 million, 2 million people wow. watching at a time. It's pretty good. Um, I think they're based in the UK. So, but what they do is they when they review their their movies, especially, it's quite funny because they review these movies like uh, do you, have you all ever watched Sherlock? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's that one in the last season he plays with his sister. Yes. The violin, and oh. it sounds really good, right? Yes. But then they, when they review it, they are like, this is just really flashy, uh, not natural, <laughs> not uh, it's not realistic, and they even do uh, reviews of the idol, you know, all those. Um, America's Got Talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they, and the way they look at it, they, they say a lot of times, it's not that they're, they're not playing well. Mm-hmm. They're, they're playing well. But it's the reactions. Because the audience like, <gasps> at the most simple parts. You know, like, huh. like for example, they give an example of, you know, the violin is going, they say that's super easy. Anybody can do it. And it's actually the parts where they go slow, for example, that takes a lot of skill. And so they get annoyed because they're like, you don't really Nobody appreciate yeah. yes. you don't appreciate what this person is doing yes yeah. definitely you know so, but they have to be able to sell it so these violinists they're not classically trained but they can sell to the masses mm. you know they move around like <laughs> just you don't have to do it you know <laughs> dancing while playing the violin mm. you know it's not necessary but you know that you have to market it to people definitely yeah. 100% that, that is exactly how it is in, mm. in the MMA scene sadly enough that is how it is because like a lot of people love to... Why is boxing and Muay Thai such a huge thing? People like seeing other people getting punched in their face. Yeah. But like in MMA so many times... Because I'm like on Twitter when I watch UFC fights. And then I'm like debating with a bunch of people. Because it's just fun. <laughs> and you see a lot of people with their comments sometimes. Like, <laughs> oh, this fight is boring. I'm like, no, what are you talking about? It was boring. The grappling was amazing. Like the wrestling or the jiu-jitsu. Because I understood what was going on. I was like, whoa... He, how is he going to get out of this? He needs to do this. But then you see him get out in like a completely different way where he's like rolling or like moving the arm in a certain way. But people see it and just like boring, stand up the fight. The fight was always on the ground. Yeah. And I'm watching the jiu-jitsu like this is some very technical shit. Yeah. Like this is not easy because I do jiu-jitsu. So when I watch it, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is hard. How is he going to get out of this? <laughs> and people are like, oh, it's boring. Stand the fight out. I'm like, no, you do not understand. This is a good fight to watch. Mm. And even in the wrestling, like, when a fighter pins another fighter towards the cage, cage wrestling, and they're like, oh, he's not doing anything and all that. It's like, <laughs> no, it's, he's, fi- he's waiting for an opening. Mm. That's why he's just there. Sometimes it's really stalling. But suddenly it's just that you cannot rush in these things. Mm. In wrestling, cage wrestling, if you rush, you will lose the opportunity or the person's going to escape. Mm, mm, so, mm. I feel like that's just that lack of comprehension. Just like, you know, the violin and all that. Mm. But then, if you see the most well-paid fighters in the UFC, mm. are all strikers. The mm. ones that knock out blows, yeah. uh, finisher chokes, Conor all these McGregor. things. Those are the ones that get paid the most. <laughs> flashy lah, flashy. Yeah. But that sells. Um, I mean, but, I guess that would explain Usain Bolt. I mean, no one has gone crazy for runner until that. He, yeah, you are to entertain actually. the people, right? Yeah. 
Damn, he was a good self promoter also. Yeah, you need to. <laughs> yeah, you need As to, an yeah. athlete, you sad to say, but even though you can be the best athlete in the world, mm. if you don't know how to sell yourself. It's hard to make money also. Like mm. even Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, oh. great boxer, great athlete, and he was famous. He was famous, but you know what made him like a have this sort of cult of personality when he bit off that dude's ear. Do you all yeah. remember that? Oh. <laughs> yeah, remember that. <laughs> that took his career to another level. Yes. He was a great boxer. Like he was a great boxer. But when he did that, he became a legend. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. It is these kinds of things. It's sometimes not the stuff you do in the cage or in the ring. It's sometimes outside. That's mm. where how you get people to fall in love with you and all mm. these things. Of course, even post fight whatever it is, that's just how people love you because of your personality and all that. Mm. Conor McGregor did that. Mm. He knew how to really just sell himself and that's why people love the shit out of him. Chris, uh, uh, Ronda Rousey mm. as well. She knew how to sell mm. herself. Yeah, yeah. Ronda Rousey Until, also until she famous. got beat quite a few times and I think was... I mean, why do you think she retired? I mean, Ronda. she's been in the scene for she's, such a long time. She's quite old. Yeah, I mean, for, exactly. As an athlete, you know, you like only have a period. Like, she was like late 30s, 40? Yeah, yeah, Something, yeah. that's oh, old. That's okay. old. Even Daniel Cormier is still fighting at 40 plus. That is old. Mm. I'm still surprised he's still fighting. And with this type of contact sports, um, you only have… Okay, again, this is not my area of expertise. I just… I'm from the school of Joe Rogan. <laughs> That's how I know all of this. <laughs> I watch a lot of Joe Rogan stuff. Okay, so somehow I've just learned about this. <laughs> but uh, like one of the things is with this type of contact spots, you have a, a time limit. Yes, definitely. Because the amount of pounding you're getting, mm. it does damage your body. That's why if you are a smart fighter, your career lasts longer. Mm. If you're kind of fighter who loves to stand and bang, mm. then your career is going to get cut short because of all the concussions and all these <laughs> kinds of things. 100%. Yeah. So it depends what kind of fighter you are. There are some fighters like Justin Gaethje. Mm. He is good. If you listen to his interviews with his coaches, his coaches say he's the most technical fighter in the gym. Mm. But he goes to the fight, he stands and bangs. Mm. But it's not like he doesn't know. He mm. knows how to like be technical, move around, win in a different way, in a smarter way. But he just loves that entertainment aspect of just standing and banging with his opponents. Uh, but it's not going to be fun when you get like dementia and… You know, like, <laughs> that's a way down the road, mm, right? Yeah, that's way down the road. But <laughs> sometimes, you know, as fighters, sometimes you don't think about it. It's mm. like, why do we even get into this sport? Because we know the risks as well. Yeah. Uh, C what was that? CRT? Is that one C of the… Yeah, CTE. Uh, CTE. Yeah. Uh, dementia. Yes, <laughs> all these things we know it's going to happen to us. Like, mm. we already have… I don't know if most fighters… For me, um, I already kind of weighed out the pros and cons. I was like, I know this kind of things might happen to me. Mm. So… But doesn't mean it's going to stop me. So I just need to be smarter. Mm. So like, if I know this is going to happen… So I know after every fight, I'll listen to my coaches. I'll take time off. Mm. I don't spar for maybe two months. Mm. I don't spar at all after a fight. So my head mm. has time to recover. And that way, I can last longer in my career as well. Mm. And I also believe if you have very good coaches, your team, good team, good coaches around you, good people to guide you, you really can go far in your career. Because mm. I started literally like not really knowing much. Mm. But because of my coaches, like they really do take care of me. They really guided me a lot. Because when I started, like in a sense, like training a lot was when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And I started fighting when I was about… 19, 20 years old. Actually, your your background basically is ballet, uh, dance. Actually, I used to do a lot of things. I used to be a competitive basketball player as well. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I used to be… I'm a very active kid. My parents have <laughs> always been, you need to be active. So my dad, mm. when I was like 7, 6, 7, he used to take me on the weekends. He, when he doesn't have work, he used to take me to the park to play basketball. Mm, mm, and mm. like, just a small kid with like a ball and then trying to shoot the the big people hoop. Mm. And, yeah, <laughs> Did you ever… Uh, sometimes in very weird ways. Like, <laughs> I used to shoot. And he didn't mind. He just he just brought me to play basketball with him. My mom used to take, take us hiking, my brother and I. Mm. And martial arts has always been something because they always wanted us to learn self-defense. Mm. So, I did do ballet because I wanted to. I also did music mm -hmm. because of my parents but also because I loved it as well. And it just kind of evolved over time. But I used to switch to different martial arts over time. Uh, dance, ballet, and all these kinds of things as well. Basketball, I played until I was 
16. Mm-hmm. And competitive basketball before I switched over to road running and trail running and then eventually obstacle course racing. Yeah, you, and were, then doing eventually like MMA. you were doing like wiper yeah, challenges. Yeah, Spartan. I was representing yeah. Malaysia to go around as well. Nice. And even dancing also. Yeah, I mean, like, what are we doing with our lives? <laughs> <laughs> I've got other things yeah. going on. <laughs> How many board games have you won? <laughs> A lot more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel like it's just like, I don't know. I've always been that. Even like, yes, I did do ballet. It wasn't something that was huge for me. But it really did help. It was something because I love dancing. Even now, I started picking back up dancing again because I missed it so much. But I'm sure like the the the, the rhythm, the tempo, the Helps movements. so much. Because with especially like things like boxing, yeah. your rhythm is so important yes. and your feet movement, it's all uh, leg movement uh, that is very, very important. It was why, because of that base, that when… Because just as I stopped ballet was when I started Muay Thai. Mm. So… I started and stopped around that same time frame. So when I finished off my advanced foundation, I stopped. And then I started doing focusing on Muay Thai and everything else. So more. from like leg lifts, you went to <laughs> leg kicks. Yes. <laughs> and it helped so much. I picked up Muay Thai so easily yeah, because yeah. of that base. Yeah. I could move easily. I could kick easily because I already knew my own stability. Yeah. I knew my weight placement. I knew how to move. I knew how to twist. I was very aware of my body. And I suppose with ba- ballet, you'd have a strong core. You have to. You, yeah. So And that would help with Muay Thai as well. And Jiu-Jitsu, even because of dance. I feel like dance really… Like you see a lot of MMA fighters. A lot of them do dance. Mm. <laughs> like Isra Adesanya. Mm-hmm. He dances. Chris Cyborg dances too. Mm. Like it's, it's… One is fun. But at the same time, it's a different way of learning mind-muscle connection. Because when you dance, you need to learn how to isolate. So you need to know how to move. You need to really understand your body. So taking that in a fun way of learning how to understand how your body moves and you put it into MMA, it's going to make it so much easier to do a lot of things. Like in jiu-jitsu and wrestling, you know your body can move like this. So you also know your limits, but you also know how far you can go. Mm -hmm. So you kind of learn a lot of things. Even footwork as well. Because dancing, you learn a lot of footwork. So imagine in a cage fight, you need footwork. Footwork is the most basic thing, mm. but it's the most important thing. That's how you get out of bed. Uh, like if you get stuck towards the cage, that's how you're going to get out. That's how you move out away of your punches. That's how you move around without getting hit. So, you know, that base gives you that nice, beautiful transition into martial arts. Okay, so but that's the physical element. But yeah. I would suppose with mixed martial arts, there is you would have to have this desire to destroy hurt, hurt someone. <laughs> Don't you need that aggression to like bring that that person down? Yeah. So like where does that come from? <laughs> where does that deep anger? <laughs> Was it your ballet teacher? Was it because you couldn't score put in the ball in the hoop? <laughs> where did that anger come from? <laughs> That's actually a very interesting question because like um, most of my friends like people who meet me they're mm. like you're, you're actually quite nice and quite friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you fighting? <laughs> and like, uh, like sometimes I go with my dad, like go to church and stuff. Yeah. And then, uh, I usually like wear a dress or sometimes heels and then I go to church. Yeah. And then he introduces me to some of the aunties there. It's like, oh, this is my daughter. And it's like, oh, hi. Uh, is this the daughter that, or is that you have another one? <laughs> Just like, I'm standing in front of her in makeup and yeah. heels and a dress. She's like, do you have another daughter? <laughs> yeah. like, no, this is the only one. Is this the one that, like, yeah. They were, like, they were, and they're like looking at me like They confused. were expecting a super muscular, <laughs> giant, <laughs> six foot five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's the misconception. And yeah. then they're like, huh? <laughs> and they look at me and I can see the confusion in their face. And for me, it starts to be very amusing. Yeah. And I mean, it's good that you take it with good yeah. fun. La. <laughs> Even like, I think, like I had a very good conversation with my brother recently and he's like, you need to realize a lot of things. Mm. So I started really like a lot of thinking, self-actualization, all that. Sure. It's, and sometimes you have to accept that inside you, there is a little demon sometimes inside in a sense where… For sure. Because like you need… Because in order to fight, right? One, you need the heart. You cannot… You, you, you can't teach heart. Yeah. Like it, it's something that is within you. Because in in the fight, you can get beat badly. Are you going to give up or are you going to keep fighting? Mm. Even like, if I'm going to lose, I'm going to die trying, you know, sort of thing. And I, it took me a long time to accept the fact that there was a part of me inside that loved hurting people. <laughs> it, it's a, if you ask me this like maybe a year ago, I was like, no, I don't. But <laughs> it, 
it's a lie. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I know that that's one of the reasons was because like it felt so good. Yeah. Like it's horrible. Like I respect my opponents. I love them so much. I made so many great friends after each fight. And it's full respect because we're both athletes. We came mm. in here, we got ready and all that. But I can't deny the fact that when I see blood mm. on my opponent's face, I want to hurt her more. I mm. want to punch more. It gets me excited. Yeah. I can't lie. There's that dark side of me that is like, ooh. Mm. No, I'm going to keep punching. <laughs> it's a, it's a, actually a young in uh, idea. Carl Young. What do you mean? Uh, he says that… Primal um, instinct. You know, uh, yeah. And that every person… He would call it the shadow. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. And that every person has this suppressed… We all suppress um, the most unpleasant parts of ourselves mm. deep down. And we refuse to recognize them. Like for example, the ability for us to hurt people is something we repress. Mm. Uh, or the most unpleasant things, like for example, as guys, maybe uh, we think we're good guys, but deep down, there's actually that thing in us that would maybe take advantage of a girl yes. because of basal yes. instincts. Or or another example, if you think that turn back time to World War II, you would have been on the good side. Uh, high chances, no. You would have been a Nazi. Yeah. Because we all have this repressed... Uh, darkness that sort of actualizes in certain circumstances. Yes, they call it the shadow. very true. And mm. I feel like maybe that was one of the things because I used to say that I don't like fighting because it's the fighting isn't the answer, <laughs> violence isn't the answer. <laughs> yeah. That's what I used to say, honestly. But when the question arose, when my coach was like, do you want to fight? I just went like, yeah. And mm. I didn't even think twice. Mm. And I was like, and, and honestly at the time, yeah, I didn't think I was like 17, 18 mm. years old. When I said yes. But I didn't get to fight until like two years later. But that yes was what opened the door for me. And I really… Like as you said, like it's hard. But I feel like once as a person, you recognize this part of you. You can choose to… Because once it's like you're more conscious. You are aware. You realize this thing. Now you can control it. Yeah. So if you know there's this part of you, you can also control. Like let's say… Um, yes, I do feel like hurting someone. Let's say on the streets and whatnot. If someone does my friend wrong. Of course, you're going to have that primal instinct that I want to punch you in the face. Yeah. But because you realize this is what's happening, you're like, okay, I need to control myself. Yeah. And you don't do it. It's all about control. Everybody has that. It's just whether you choose to take action or you choose to be like, no, this is not, I'm not supposed to do this. Yeah. And that's the second part of like, I mean, Young's idea flows to that part, which is you have to integrate your shadow. Yeah. You have to integrate your shadow. You, you have to recognize the darkness in you. And that's the only way you're going to be able to not only keep them under control, but tap into your full potential. Mm-hmm. Because if not, you become a lesser version of yourself. A sort of uh, tamed, uh, petrified version of yourself. You, you, I have you, to agree this. Hmm. Like, honestly, when I started like really looking to myself, realizing all these things and really accepting that, hey, there is really a dark part of me. Like, why do I love MMA? Is it because of influence of outside? And I'm like, no. I love this because one is the adrenaline rush, but also just, you know, fighting the blood, the pain. It, it's very morbid to say it to people who don't fight because they it's hard to understand. Mm. But there's a part of me that makes it it makes it addictive, mm. weirdly enough. Yes, I've lost it before as well, but it's just so addictive for for some reason. And from there I was like, okay. And from there, I started to really like, like you say, tap into the full potential. I feel like I'm going like really starting to understand my mental and everything better. And I feel like that's going to help a lot in the future as well. Jeremy, have you ever fought? No. I mean, parents didn't even do, I think didn't even do like Taekwondo, which most Chinese parents said. <laughs> yeah, I did Taekwondo <laughs> too. <laughs> I, didn't bother, I didn't do that. I think you did more traditional Chinese things like badminton. I'm telling you, <laughs> when the Great War happens, uh, all these Taekwondo students are going to come <laughs> out. <laughs> but, but even they will admit they're not, like it's not yeah. that, it's not that useful. I think some, yeah, some I, friends de- who say that. It depends. It depends. So, I feel like a lot of the Taekwondo here mm. is very more of the Kata style. So mm-hmm. they don't really teach you how to fight. Because I know a friend, uh, when he came, he was in Malaysia for a while. He's from Korea. And he came from Malaysia. He was a black belt in, he was a black belt in Taekwondo. Like second dan or something like that. And I will tell you straight, black belt from Korea, Taekwondo, 10 times better than any black belt here in Malaysia. Yeah. And he legitimately could fight with pure Taekwondo. Because... Yeah. We, we used to spar together and all that. And he used his Taekwondo 
to spar with all of us. And it works. Mm. It really works. It's just that the kind of Taekwondo taught here is a different. Because there's different versions. So in Korea, they happen to, he happened to learn the one that really taught you how to fight. So he used all his kicks and everything in the sparring. Mm. And actually like it worked on all of us. Mm. So it's that kind of thing. It's the same like the judo here. We had a, I had a friend from Japan coming to Malaysia to learn English. And he was like a black belt in judo. Competitive judo as well. So he came here. He's like, what, 170? He's not very tall. Small Japanese guy. Of course, muscular because he's been doing judo since he was like eight. He's like my <laughs> age. And my one, a few of our MMA fighters, so he trains with us. They're like 80 kilos, 90 kilos. I'm trying to hip toss them. Like, it takes me so hard because I'm like half the <laughs> size. And I see him wrestle with my wrestling coach mm. and he just tosses him. Mm. And my wrestling coach is this big Iranian man, <laughs> muscular as hell, 80 <laughs> plus kilos. And he just went soup. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, wow. And then that's when I asked him, I was like, what have you done? Because mm. I knew he did judo, but mm. he never told us that he was a black belt or anything. <laughs> then I found out he was a competitive judo mm. black belt. And I was like, I've never seen anyone here who does judo mm. at that level, even as a black belt. And I was like, wow. Mm. Like, it's just that, it, not that the martial arts doesn't work. It's just who you learn it from and what kind did you learn from. Because there's mm. judo, and there's competitive judo. Yeah. There's taekwondo. Oh, okay. And then there's the… You actually fight with taekwondo. Mm. So there's many different aspects. It's that's like a, how that, people that's a very this. different way of looking at it. Because like Joe Rogan would say that it was because of the commercialization. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So because like he, he, he was talking to Firas about like how… Like I think it was Kung Fu or Karate mm -hmm. in, in the US. Like because they had to keep opening schools. And if you want more people to come, you'd water down the, you water down the martial arts so that yes. it's more accessible. Yes, it's very true. Yeah, it's like yeah. jujitsu. There's so many jujitsu schools. Yeah. But if you talk about the real jujitsu, how it started <laughs> from the favela, you know, all these mm. kinds of things, it's hardcore. That's how my professor comes. She comes from the traditional jujitsu side, where sometimes when it's near competition time, we have a tournament. You know what he'll do? So we are on like the first floor. So in Bangsa, Talawi. So there's windows and stuff. That's the only ventilation that comes in. Because mm. the roof is like made of foil. So it's hot as hell. <laughs> We're in our gi. So a jujitsu gi is oh. thick. It's heavy. It adds like… It's like… It essentially weighs about a kilo, a kilo and a half. If you're wearing a heavy gi. Oof. He'll close all the windows. Turn off all the fans. And then make us train like that for 90 minutes. And sometimes he'll just make us roll. And he'll just <laughs> scream at us. Like, again. Again. Make us drill. Again. 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 Push. 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 And that's how… And this is still considered like a little bit of a watered down version also. But that was how they used to train in Brazil. That's the watered down version? What the hell is the bit. real version? I don't but know. <laughs> Boil, I don't know. Hey, let's team up this place. Some, sometimes they really… In Brazil, there's no space. And yeah. they're rolling in such a small space. Or they're rolling on the ground. Oh. Like the hard earth. Because there's no place to train mm, elsewhere. Mm, mm. And they're doing that. We're lucky we have mats, mats. and all this. Mm. So he takes it up a notch by just closing all this and just pushing us till we die. At the end of <laughs> class, we are just gone. Damn. I mean, Joe Rogan's background is Taekwondo. Oh. Yeah. Oh. He was a Taekwondo martial artist. Uh, I mean, when he was a teen and up to his adulthood. Then mm. he, he went national and then eventually… I remember he recounting like, I think he would like, there would be videos of Jude. No, it was the first UFC. Yeah, he bought like videotapes of the first UFC and then got into jujitsu. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Jujitsu is honestly. We're just gonna mention Joe Rogan as much as we can. <laughs> tag him in everything. <laughs> and no, you never know that you might just start noticing your podcast and then. Yo, like, if we reference. get on a Joe Rogan episode, <laughs> we are set for life. <laughs> we just need one percent of the people that listen to him. <laughs> we are good. Oh, one one percent of his money will be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Oh, that's really cool, though. Um, yeah, that's really really interesting. So. One interesting point you said was that it's not only aggression, it's also that uh, type of will, the will to persevere. That's also Definitely. where you tap, tap into it. I feel like um, you, everybody can fight. Mm. I'm going to say it. Everybody can fight. You can learn how to fight. But what makes a fighter, like a real fighter fighter, is the heart. Mm. It, it's something that coaches can't teach. And that doesn't have to be aggression. No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't mean that… Because you have striking in different styles. You have uh, um, fighting in different styles. Some people are counter-strikers. So mm. they wait, they react. 
And some people, they are aggressive. They really push forward, push forward. Some people, they, they play a bit smarter. They move around a lot, they move around a lot. Then they see an opening, then they go. So some people are more technical. And you have so many different ways of fighting. And when it comes to the heart, it's more of a... How, how, are you, how much are you willing to put in all? Are you giving you 100%? And not only that, do, when, for me, I would say like when you can really see a fighter if is a real fighter on in the heart, it's when you're really getting beat. Like <laughs> you're really getting beat. What are you going to do? Are you going to give up? Are you going to give up the position? Are you going to give up? Or are you going to keep fighting and fighting and fighting until the bell rings? Mm. I feel like that's when you really see who a fighter is truly, who he or she is in a cage. Mm. That's when. When you're getting beat up and then you're just like… Most… Because I've seen fighters who have so many fights and all that. And then I'm watching like, you know, the local fights and stuff like that. Because I… Like, last night I went for watch a boxing fight because my cousin was fighting. And you see like… Oh, this person, big racket, fought so many fights. Yes, got wins and losses. That's normal in amateur. And then you're like, people are hyping him up. And then I see him like actually getting beat in a fight. And you can see it in their eyes where they just quit. Mm -hmm. You can see it in their eyes the <laughs> moment they just went, screw this. And just, that's it. They don't try anything. Mm. They're just, they just, that's it. There's some off switch in their head that mm. just goes click. Mm. And then that's it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I... That's for me, that's when I see like, okay, is this person really a fighter fighter or they just do this because whatever whatever their, their reason can be. Because mm. I've honestly been in the industry not very long. But I've heard so many things where, where a lot of people don't tell me this up front to my face. Mm. But I've heard like from my friends, they tell my friends and my friends tell me. Spill the tea. Spill and the like, tea. <laughs> uh, they are young kids. Not Well, can I say young because like, I'm still young like late teens and all that, why they want to do MMA or why they want to fight for the fame, for the, mm. for the hype, mm. all these kinds of things. And I'm like, to me, they would never tell this to my face mm. because they know I do this full time. So they would never tell this to their… To a, they'll never tell a fighter like this to, to their face. They will never tell any of the fighters as well. I know, I've noticed. But they told some of my friends who do fight and uh, for them, it's more of because they love it. But they also have their day job. Uh. Mm. But they love fighting also. And sometimes they tell them. And I'm like, wow. Is this the generation next? Because if you're just going to fight for fame and fight for hype, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't, I don't judge them. You want to do it? That's great. How much are you going to really put into it if you're mm. just going to fight for fame and hype? <laughs> and How can, much of your can, heart? Can that sustain you in a, in and, a ring? Yes. And another thing is, if that is your, your push, your goal are you really sure this is the spot for you? Because if that's your fame, your hype, that's why you want to do MMA, I'm going to like, it's it's not easy, one. Secondly, you're going to get hurt very <laughs> badly. It's, yes, it's cool. It's whatever it is. But do you know how much hard work um, I, like I used to train with professional fighters, like Agil Antani, Keanu Suba, mm. like all the top Malaysian MMA fighters. I got to see them really in the background because I train with them. So I watch them in the background, how much they grind, how much they hurt, their weight cuts, what they eat every day. Yeah. The, every single day I'm training with them and I see it preparing for their fights. Do you know how much work they put into and they get hurt in a fight? Yeah. Like I see my friends get watching them fight and I'm just like, my goodness, they got hurt bad, like a broken nose or mm. injured. Um, broken legs, whatever these kinds of things. Are you ready to to suffer all these things? Yeah, and I mean come that, back? that Aguilan Tani uh, fight, uh, that was like a big one. Was it last year, year before last year? Was like a really last year. Last year, right? And um he looked I mean he looked it he looked like he went to war. He looked like he was so Oh with the Japanese guy? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Dude, he looked like <laughs> like like Destroy and, and not to say that he had given up. Yeah. Not at all. But what I mean is physically, like he looked like he'd just been pounded. <laughs> right? And I just like, how are you standing? That's crazy. He he is, he is amazing. He was one of the reasons why I started MMA. Mm. He was the one that saw me in a boxing class. Mm. I just graduated from high school because I was American homeschool, so I graduated 18. Mm. And I had nothing better to do. So I was in the gym every day. My parents didn't mind. They just dropped me off in the morning and picked me up at night. So I'll just take a nap in the gym. Mm. So I'll train in the afternoon, sleep in the gym, and then train again at night. Mm. And my parents didn't mind because I was doing something like I was being active. So mm. they didn't mind that. And I 
went to the afternoon boxing class, which I never do. Mm. I decided <laughs> to go to the KL side of the gym where the fighters just finished their morning fighters training. And then he came up to me. He's like, what are you doing here? Because he used to teach me Muay Thai before my Muay Thai coach came. So he already knew me. He knew my parent, He knew my mom. And I was like, oh, I want to do boxing because I want to improve my Muay Thai, my hands. And at that time, I also did Jiu-Jitsu already. And he was like, uh, what are you doing right now? I was like, oh, right. Like, in general? He was like, yeah. I was like, nothing. I just graduate. I'm just training in the gym every day because I have nothing else to do. <laughs> He's like, we might have a girl coming to train with us. Um, why don't you come and join us next Monday? It was a Friday. So he said, next Monday, why don't you come 9.30, come and train with us? I was like, I don't know MMA. Mm. I was like, it's okay. I'll just teach you. And I was like, okay. So, because he invited me, I started coming and he opened the door for me. And I was like, my goodness. I used to think, oh, I'll fight Muay Thai mm. or I'll do Jiu Jitsu tournaments. And when he opened that door for me, I fell in love with MMA. I was like, this is amazing. Mm. I was like, what is this? <laughs> and he, I didn't know anything. Uh, and all the guys there were already, you know, they knew, they knew how to wrestle. They knew how to do everything. I didn't know how to wrestle. Mm. And he was like, it's okay. And he would actually take the time. And in class, he would teach me like, okay, you do this. And then now you do this. And then now he will go like, after class, he said, I want you to drill this like 50 times or whatnot. Yeah. And he would teach me like that. And then even my coaches also were like, okay, she's here. So let's teach her. And they would give me drills even and I ask questions. Because I was new, I didn't know a lot of things. So that's how I ask. And they'll be so patient with me. They'll be like, no, okay, you're not doing it right. You have to do it this way. Even my teammates, they were all like, the lightest guy at that time was 60 kilos. Mm. I'm like 52. Mm -hmm. wow. And they were all so patient. Even the guys, like, I have to train with them. And they're like twice my size, 70, 76 kilos. And they were so nice. Like, no, you can't, you're not supposed to do it this way. Do it this way. You have to grip like this. And they were all like very supportive. Like, even when I say like, guys, am I doing this correctly? They'll be like, yeah, just you need to move this a bit more. The adjustment and everything like that. So mm -hmm. I had like a very good supportive team as well. I think that's a big misconception. Like, misconception is that, uh, macho people macho yeah. bloodthirsty animals <laughs> out there just looking to oh, pick a are. fight <laughs> in the, in <laughs> the ring are. in the ring are, but, but I also think uh, they also <laughs> like what I've heard they're also very nice la, you know they're very nice they dudes they are like Agilan like I guess I'm very blessed I get to see that side of him mm. he is the sweetest and nicest person you ever meet honestly and, but and, in the in the cage you see him like he's he but like, even outside the cage you would think that they would be like you, you know you were talking about uh, walking down the street and you want to <laughs> whack someone but then you control yourself because what happens is when you know you can hurt someone else there's a confidence and a surety that comes yes, with it of course. Uh, compared to someone who doesn't know and you're in a dangerous environment you might overreact Mm. I have to agree my friend he's uh, studying masters in psychology mm. he did mention something about um, being able like having the ability mm. and not doing it is real self-control yeah it's because yeah. it's not like you have no choice. You have the ability to, but you choose not to because you know that it's not the right thing to do as well. Yeah, I heard an interview. I can't remember what it was, but it, Jason Leung talking to someone else. I think it was uh, a bit of culture on BFM. Mm. And Jason Leung was on. And Jason Leung does jiu-jitsu. Oh. Um, yeah, he does. Mm. Um, and so, uh, because he he's passed with my ex 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 boss uh, <laughs> Tan Ji Jun. He is he also uh -huh. did uh, jiu jitsu. Actually, I learned of jiu jitsu from that guy. Yeah, uh, my my ex 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 ex, ex, ex boss. Uh, because he was really really into it. Mm -hmm. Like um, okay, so two stories uh. I, I tell you my what my ex boss told me. He basically I did a paralegal stint, and then he sat me down at the end of my paralegaling, and he gave me like this big talk club. <laughs> you know, I thought he was gonna like don't practice law kind of thing. But no, he was really nice. Told me my strengths, my weaknesses. Then he told me <clears throat> about, he just went on this like, like I don't know, like some sort of wisdom. <laughs> wisdom <Lecture>. moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lecture, whatever. He was like, Roshan, five things changed my life. Um, the death of my father. My first heartbreak. Uh, the, the, the day I married my wife. My son being born. And the last thing, jiu-jitsu. <laughs> 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 did you see it come, did you see it coming? I didn't see it coming. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Then the last jiu-jitsu. Ah, uh, all right. Because that time I, I didn't know much about it. Then it felt like he was trying to sell me jiu-jitsu. <laughs> it 
change your life though. Yeah, Honestly, yeah. like for me, when I joined, you know, doing MMA and all these things, my coaches don't know, but they gave me a purpose because mm. I was going through a hard time at 17, 18 years old. Yeah. Going through depression and a lot mm. of other things, mental health things as well. I didn't know how to cope. Mm. I was doing very unhealthy things to cope. And joining the gym, unknowingly, my coaches uh, helped me a lot because in the gym, I was just another student and they were pushing me to be the best that I could be. Mm. They were... They want things to be perfect, which was fine because I want things to be perfect too. And they'll push me, they'll scream at me, they'll shout at me. No, you're not doing it right. Again, again, again. But because of that, it helped, it actually helped my mental health. Like it got me out of it and it saved me so much. Just this, for me, MMA was not only something that um, was something that I fell in love, but it was something that saved me as well as a teenager. Because, you know, as a teenager, you don't know how to deal with a lot of things. Going through your first heartbreak, going through a lot of, uh, you know, peer pressure, um, you know, people lying to you. You know, you're coming across into the real world mm. and you're seeing the world for how it actually is. And you're just going like, this is not how I imagine the world <laughs> is going to be. Why is the world so cruel? Why is the why people just like, they can lie to you so easily because they want, have their own agenda. And you're just like, you know, you have so much mistrust, you have so much confusion. And you know, you have all these things. And then when I did MMA, I like every single class afterwards, I felt amazing. Yeah, I mean, I totally understand that. It's almost like uh, as you grow older, you know, you you think you're becoming more free, right? You, mm. you think you're becoming <laughs> more free. You know, oh, my parents are not, you know, they don't tell me what I can do, cannot do. But then as you go with those freedoms, there, there's a price to pay. Lah. Yes, there is. Um, yeah, unlim- <laughs> especially the, the, the moments the times that we are living in, with a lot of freedom comes a lot of anxiety. Yes. Because you have unlimited choices. You don't even know where to go, what to do. And then of course, there's so much of like, hurt out there. And it's so easy to hurt people now without any accountability. And things like that, you know. So, it can be very damaging. And But when it comes to, I guess, physical, uh, uh, not even workouts, but like physical mm-hmm. things like you're doing, it's a grounding in reality. It's one of the few things you can really be sure of. Yes. You know, it's very binary. You can either do it well or not well. <laughs> yeah, you can yeah. even improve or not. Definitely. And it's a, sort of an anchor, I suppose, that helps you ground your reality in a better way. I don't know. Do you have... I mean, you work out, right? You you do... Uh, uh, High-intensity uh, interval training. <laughs> hit. Yeah. Jeremy's getting his hit. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun, but I do it. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm sure... Do you find a similar experience? I don't think it's the same because I think it doesn't have that sense of routine mm. and structure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more of a social thing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, for me, it's more. But, but what about that? The, the challenge and the, you know the oh, I can't do it, but then you get better and better and better. That is that. It does that. So oh, that, you're not getting better. No, I'm not getting better. <laughs> <laughs> it's more maintenance thing. I think it's uh-huh. very different from developing a skill mm-hmm. because I'm not. You're not going to get infinitely better at burpees. <laughs> you're not. Uh, <laughs> but you do oh, become. No, don't invite. <laughs> have me a but you do become like stronger, right? Uh. Yes, but you must be willing to put in the time. Yeah. Because yeah. you can go once a week, mm-hmm. twice a week, and that's good amount of maintenance. You just want to, like me, eat whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, it's a societal uh, yeah, I don't, co- I don't community. Think it, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think it's the same. Like, not, not so much, not even so much community, but it, yeah, it doesn't have that kind of structural effect. Because mm. it's not it's, it's not routine. Like I mean, the guy will yell at me, but it's, <laughs> not, it's not the same. <laughs> but I'm sure even with yours, there is a community aspect De- definitely because one. if you talk about becoming a good MMA fighter, anything, yes, in the cage we're alone. The only people outside our corners that scream and shout at us, <laughs> tell us what to do. But it's a it's the team. Mm. It's still a team. Yes, you're alone in that cage. When that cage is locked, you are <laughs> stuck inside. The only way out is jumping over the cage. And yeah, literally you're alone. But without your team, without your coaches, without a good team and good coaches, you will not be in there. So in the background, you still need a good team behind you, people to help you train, to push you to be better. Yeah. And my teammates are amazing. They push me to be better. My coaches are more than coaches. They're like father figures and mm. all that. They even help me through a lot of things on and off the mats. Like my professor, my 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 coach, my MMA coach as well, my Muay Thai coach. Like, because they've seen me from when I was like 17 years old. So when I was a kid, 
all the way up till now. Mm. Even now, people ask them like, who's that girl? It's like, how old is she? It's like, 18. I'm like, professor, I'm 22 now. <laughs> it's like, it's like, They're not keeping be, track. You'll always be 18. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> I am 22. <laughs> yeah, they, they'll forget. And they've helped me so much. Like, they have a lot of like, of course, words of wisdom on yeah. and off the mats. And they really do care. Even in my camps outside, like when I got really badly injured, um, I, I really want to still keep training. It got to a point where by the end of the year, my injury was really, really bad. Like, I couldn't kneel down. I cannot walk up the steps without it hurting. I cannot squat. I cannot sit on the ground and bend my legs for too long. When I say too long, it's like one minute. Mm. I couldn't cross my legs. And it reached to that point, And I was still trying to come for class. Mm. But I was so limited. And it reached to a point where… Because MMA, you have few coaches, right? So my coaches were all like… They do communicate with each other. They were like you are not coming for class. I don't want to see you for the next two months. Mm. You're taking time off. Mm. And they told me straight up, it's like, I don't want to see you until next year. Mm. You're out of the gym. I want you to go fix your body, fix your injury, and then come back. Like, it got to that point. And to be honest, how many coaches would tell you that? Yeah. How many coaches would care so much about you seeing and being able to see your potential before you see it, mm. push you so much, and then still say these things and know that no matter what, you're gonna come back. I- I've never met any coach or ad- other instructor you, like, that was that is like that. That say, get out of the gym, yeah. go and rest, and I'll see you in two months. Yeah, because they're basically protecting you. They're protecting me, and they saw potential in me that I never saw. My jujitsu professor, one day, I was only doing nogi once a week. Mm-hmm. I would come because my brother he said, "Oh, my friends brought me to nogi. Why don't you come try with me?" We're, my brother and I are very close, mm. and I was like, "Okay." What's your brother's name again? Nicholas. Nicholas, shout out Nicholas if you're going to listen yes. to this. Hopefully you will. Yes. <laughs> sound like, you sound like a good brother. Man. He is. He is. He's amazing. Like, I love him and so And you're much. a Joe Rogan fan. So that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you're always invited yeah. to come on. We can talk about Joe <laughs> <laughs> And he, like, my brother's always been by my side. Whenever mm. I can bring him to my fights, I always bring him because he always makes me feel very comfortable. Mm. And my professor actually came up to me after like a few months. He's like, I see you once a week. Every week, I will see you for sure. Mm. And you're improving. I can see it. But because like the other girls, they only they come every single day. Because they, ha- they have a gi. So they bought they have a, the gi uniform and then they train in it in, for jiu-jitsu. But I don't. So I only come for no gi. He's like, I can see you improving. But not as fast as them. And not as fast as I believe you can. Mm. He's like, you can actually improve so much faster and so much better. Like… Mm. You can. Like, I see potential in you. Mm. In jiu-jitsu. And I was like, like, how many months into jiu-jitsu? And he, he up front just talked to me like that. And I was like, 18 at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, a professor that I didn't think was noticing me in general. Because you have a class of 50 people. Mm-hmm. How would you imagine your professor actually notices you? You know, takes attention and detail to you. And I was like, I was taken aback. And I was like, okay. I told the professor, I was like, when I graduate from high school, I promise you, I will buy a gi, I will join your class. And I actually did it. And I trained, I trained, and then first tournament. So I was going to compete for my first tournament. I was training every day. I had a really close friend then. He helped me so much. And he would help me. Like, I will say after class, like, can you please drill with me? So I take him and I'll drill 100 ambas. So after jiu-jitsu class, I'll train 100 ambas. The next day, 100 triangles from guard. Next day, uh, 100 times how to pass guard. And that's what I did for the competition. I competed and won gold medals. Mm. Like my first competition. Mm. and In Malaysia? Yeah, in Koh Phangan, Malaysia. And it was my first time. And I remember looking at my professor. And he was like, I told you so. <laughs> it's like from then until then. And I was like… After the competition, I was like, Wow. I did not see this in myself. But my professor saw it in me from, from day one. Mm. Even my Muay Thai coach asking me to fight. I was only with him for six to eight months. And he was like, Colleen, do you want to fight? And I was like, of all people in the class, you're asking me. Like in my brain. I said yes anyway. But he saw something in me that I never saw until now. Only now did I start to understand what was it that they saw in me. Mm. And I was like, I'm internally grateful for like, Professor Bernino Barbosa and my coach Conrado Fulan, like, if they didn't see that, I don't think I'll be where I am, mm-hmm. honestly speaking. That's really cool. I mean, you were talking also about 
these aunties looking at your <laughs> church and you not really fitting the sort uh, of uh, stereotype, yes. <laughs> right? I it's very enjoyable to see reactions. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, uh, like uh, you're active on social. Yes, and of um, on social, yeah, there is the 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 martial arts aspect, but you also put on display your femininity. Yes, femininity, of course. Yeah, that's yes, right. femininity. Yeah, so you 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 you're not afraid to uh, you know you you don't have to be a man to fight. You yes. know, you, you can also be a woman. And you can also be a fighter, yes. right? And I wonder what are your um, experiences being in a hyper? Is it safe to say a really hyper masculine sort of environment? It is. It is. It's it's facts. It is hyper masculine. But it's really interesting. You don't. It seems like you don't get any pushback. I mean, I do. Mm. I just generally know how to deal with it. That mm. one I have to thank my parents for the way they brought me up. Mm. And um, for me, I do. Sometimes I get comments where they're like, I get, ma- really enough, majority from men, of all <laughs> people, uh, from guys, that they're just like, oh, why do you do this sport? You're so pretty. Because I do do some modeling on the side just for fun. Because yeah. it brings me out of my comfort zone. It makes me more comfortable. Who are these guys? Who are these guys? <laughs> why are you guys and, so free? And, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? What and, the heck? <laughs> can can yeah. we just talk about, because before the podcast, we were talking about... Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh God, we no. were talking about a fix, uh, a fixation, <laughs> right? Because my ex boss told me the best feeling in the world is getting choked out, <laughs> right? And uh, Joe Rogan also spoke about it. David Blaine spoke about it, <laughs> all right. And there might be like a biological thing that you know your who knows that your brain maybe some down. adrenaline rush or cortisol. Yeah, right. your, your your brain shutting down, coming back up. Yeah. You know, it's like a jump start. There might be some surge of hormones. We don't know. Yeah. But you know, a lot of people have. So it's a sexual kink, A lot of people yes. like to get choked out and whatever. Uh, to each his own. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't advocate for it. I think, uh, people's sexual lives are complicated enough without choking. You know, people have died. Yeah, I'm yes, sure yes, people yes, have yes died. of course. Right, so... No, 10 years ago, there was like a what, plastic bag challenge. Like, kids oh would do it. Oh my Yeah, God. I've heard that. A few years ago, I, I, recently, a year or two ago, there was a girl who uh, came to Malaysia. She's a foreigner. And in her Tinder profile, she put that she liked like BDSM and liked to, okay. you know, mm. things like that. And... Uh, yeah, she died. And the guy's defense was that she asked, she him. asked him to uh, she asked him to choke her. Yeah. Right? And then she died. I, I feel like when you come to all these things, right, it you know, talking about like is this not, is this a very taboo subject to talk about? Go yeah, for okay. it. Okay. So like for, for, for me We're both church to go as but I think we should talk about <laughs> these things, yo. Uh, but I do believe that everyone has their own right to their own sexuality and all sure. that. Pedophilia is not sexuality. Mm. Gonna just say it out there. That doesn't count. Mm. But like people who like this, some some would consider weird kings and all that. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you have a trusted partner. Mm. Yes, I understand because she asked for it. But that's why when it comes to all these very um, trust-based things, because choking someone is… <laughs> even in jujitsu, you trust your partner with your life that yeah. you know if you tap out, they're gonna let go. Because yeah. they can choose not to. Yeah. And you just fall asleep or you could die. And you really need to have that trust with your partner in mm. order to do stuff like this. I think that's when a lot of things come into play. Consent. Mm. My my position is I I think that everybody should we we I don't think police should go around and telling telling people or um, mandating how people should have perform their sex lives. But <laughs> I do I do think that we need to ask ourselves. Is this healthy sexual behavior? Because I think there is unhealthy sexual behavior. There is unhealthy. Of course, there's always going to be some unhealthy aspect. It's just how are you going to um, deal with it? Yeah. So I think like the problem is I, I really I get where you're coming from and I understand it, but like I just think that we shouldn't be. It's I think it's tricky when we say uh, mm. to each his own because yes. I feel we have to tell people like, look, there is behavior that is not healthy, and you might wanna. Go to a psychologist and check like, okay, what's the underlying? Why do you like watching your partner have sex with someone else? Like, ah. uh, right? There could be something. Are you afraid? You know, deep down, are you really afraid? And you need, you know, you need to show that, mm-hmm. you know, it, it could be something deep down. A hurt yes, deep yes. down is manifesting, right? So this, 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 so, this treads into the territory that all these things have trauma. Not, I'm not saying some, I, I, some do. I won't, some I won't do, be. This is a, this is a, very this is a very convenient argumentation no okay so let me let me be careful i can't confidently say that all 
sexual behavior is you know uh, has some based on some trauma like yeah. for example choking there might be a biological element you might derive yeah. pure pleasure from it but i'm i'm saying that at the same time it's not a stretch to say that uh sexual proclivities outside the norm even though that's a weird word uh, might be caused by trauma you know i i don't think that's a stretch that one's going to be quite hard very tricky because again as you said to each his own so everybody has their own little yeah we, i mean we all have a little bit of like um we, I, I think people should should make their own judgement calls on this i, I don't yeah. i don't I'm, think so i'm not for state intervention definitely i so I think this has been used against the LGBT community too often. Okay, I'm also mm. not for state intervention, but I think that we should tell people that there is unhealthy sexual behavior and you need to be introspective. I, I think, it, I think it we can be, tell we can tell people that, but I yeah. think depends how you want how hard you want to push it because yeah. I think like for example BDSM, you know, right? It 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 might be like uh, 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 something that happened in your life that you need to deal with. It could be but it very well could I mean, be. But if it's not... Yeah, it could be just... But what if uh, it is? Then I mean, they, that's, that's what call, I said. Right? To yeah. each his own. Yeah. For some people, it's really just purely just... it's They just like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, okay. Coming back to yeah. what we were already <laughs> talking about. Yeah. We, we, so we were talking about a fi- uh, fixation. Yes. Uh, getting choked out, whatever. And you said there were guys that were messaging you <laughs> on what? Instagram? Instagram. Because I'm more active there. Offering to, to pay you <laughs> to get choked out. Right? Yes. Who? Guys, <laughs> what the heck's wrong with you? Okay, you can't just message people and how much were they offering? The, what, what was the, One, uh, what's the thousand, market price here? 1,000. My friend got offered like 500 US dollars. I think I was like saying like, no, this is stupid. And then I just <laughs> and then he ended up upping his price like 750, 1,000 US dollars. Damn, son. Nearly 1,005. Ah, yikes. So, but, but arguably in a free society, I mean, yeah, you, you there get, is a contract uh, freedom of speech. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's a free market, but I just think, dudes, you're a bit too free, lah. And with such, a, you know, the wisdom of it, because we live in such a, uh, you know, everyone gets called out, right? I'm like, are you, you guys are like living life on the edge, lah. <laughs> right. I mean, people you have all rec- are brave, man. Yeah. I mean, if people have receipts that it was all consensual. Then, like, you remember that comedian you said, like. Who managed to <laughs> Louis C.K. Yeah, no, no, the the oh, this Aziz. one, the one guy who you said like who slept oh, with girls who was just I, I remember eight, his just name. eighteen in the podcast. I didn't mention him, but I remember his name now. Chris Chris Diella. Yeah, so he, like he would can, like basically kind of like groom, not groom. Well, yeah, maybe you, I don't know what's your definition, but yeah. he would date these girls who are underage, but he would only hook up with them after date. That's called grooming. Yeah, that's called grooming. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, so basically he would only hook up. Yeah, it is grooming lah. Only hook up with them when they turn 18. So when he got called out, he was like, nope, nope, nope. You know, all of them were 18. But people were like, dude, that's like, you know, he had just all the shy of yeah. being legal. La, you know? But you were being also like, let's say like, if you already dating them before, it's already wrong. Yeah. Doesn't have to be sexual, but you're already dating them is wrong. That's pedophilia. But it's... Uh, no, I don't think it's pedophilia. Because pedophilia under is... under 18. No, pedophilia would be lesser than that. Pedophilia is would it? be under 12. Okay, my bad. It might be pre- pre-pubescent. But uh, it's a bit more trickier when they are teenagers. Societally, you, it's, we can observe it. Because uh, what's her, her name? Um, was it Kylie Jenner? Was dating Tiger? Oh, yeah. She was underage. She was 15 yeah. or something when they started dating. It was so weird. You know, he was so weird, but no one said like anything. <laughs> like no one said anything. Yeah, it's damn weird. And I think they probably started dating when she turned 18 as well. I oh, feel okay. like… I think so. I I'm not like really if, informed about it. If this. let's say like… I understand because there's a reason why there's a certain legal age and all that is to protect, you know, each party and all that. But yeah, it's true. Can't uh, say because they're teenagers. But also if you're let's say a 25 your old man, 30 year old man, what are you going for someone who's No, it's thinking? it's definitely very suspect just because like the power difference is so so wide. It's the same thing with a lecturer dating a student or with even like a step parent dating a, a, a you know, you know, falling in love with your your kid, your stepchild yeah, because yeah. you know your the the age gap is so wide and um, your experience level is so different. It's so easy for you to manipulate and so it's very Bad, bad behavior. La. It's it, ethically, you can call out that kind of behavior. True. 
Yeah. True. Because these are basically kids in school. Your brain is not even developed until you. Your brain is still developing. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> twenty four, I true. think. I think it, your brain fully does until twenty four. Yeah. So like these are kids, and you are so much more, you know, ahead of them, and so you can use a lot of things to manipulate them. Even if you're a nice, nice person, I would say like you need to think at a societal level. What about the people who are not as, not as has has no, uh, not as virtuous as you are, You know. I mean, this changed the. This changes the. I mean, one way to look at it is, would it have been any better if the people who were messaging you and offering you were closer to your age? Like, I don't know. Like, that doesn't that really That would have up. both be equally weird. Yeah, that would have Sorry, because meaning? I don't understand. Like, the people who DM'd her, uh-huh. like, if they were, like, closer to her age, would the power dynamic be different? Like, would... And generally... It's still, it's still the same for, yeah, for me. Yeah, kind of transaction. Just, no, but that wouldn't be grooming anymore. Yeah, like, that wouldn't be grooming. It's no. just, that's a bit weird. <laughs> that's just weird. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. If, even these also, I find it straight up weird. But... We do live in a society where uh, sexualization is very common. Like, I even get messages from guys, not not about choking, mm. but like commenting about my body, saying that, uh, like, oh, you look so you look so pretty. You do some modeling. Why not just f- do that instead of beating up your pretty face and doing MMA? Mm. And uh, I get another message saying like, oh, you shouldn't look so bulky or muscular. You should look like uh, just lean and tone, you will look better like that. Mm. And I was like, and these are complete and strangers, right? Kind of like some people, like I sort of like, yeah, in a sense, strangers because I don't really know them. They just message me and I be friendly and I do chat with them. And then they think they get comfortable and then they start telling me these things. And I'm just like, <laughs> you do not understand why I do what I do. So yeah. you do not have any right to comment like so that. So you actually reply them? No, I just ignore when it reaches that's, that that's point. That's wise. That's why. Because I really, because I really have so many weird messages over the years <laughs> that I'm just like done. I was like, I have, I realize I don't always need to respond. For sure. Sometimes I just leave it. I'm like, because yes, I do get upset. Internally, I'm like, you have no right to comment about my body, how it should look and anything like that. If I want to look, if I'm, if I'm going to be muscular, I'm going to do it because I want to. You, you don't get any say in how I look. If I want to look like this, I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? Like for me is, like I do believe like, you know, your body is a temple. All these kinds of things like we learn in uh, theor- theology of the body. Yeah. But it's also… Oh, wow. Look at that. Like, it's also, I rarely hear people quoting T.O.B. Mm-hmm. man. <laughs> Honestly, that was the best part for me in confirmation because yeah. it really taught me the aspect of… Catholicism and talking about sex and all these things. Because yeah. as a teenager, you're going through all these changes. You have such weird thoughts and desires. And then mm. when you have that guidance, it says, it's okay. It's normal for you to have these things. This is how you can go through with it and how you kind of live with it. Yeah. And because we hear so much from the Catholic Church where it goes like demonizing all these things. Yeah. But imagine when you tell a teenager... You you are bad. You having this, you are a bad person. You cannot have carnal desires. And then you hear from Theology of the Body, St. John Paul II, that created yeah. this, that said, Damn, you, so are, you are a teenager. <laughs> You're a teenager. It's okay for you to do This is how you deal with it. Yeah. And it's it's like, you are body and soul. soul yeah. You cannot neglect one without the other. Mm. It's the same with the masculine and feminine uh, aspect yin and yang mm. you cannot have one without the other because I know this because I was living just neglecting the nurturing side of myself the side that wanted to be a bit feminine that wanted to like do things that um, nurture my growth my creativity and all these kinds of things and I was only doing MMA every day which is a very masculine very you just head on every day every day strong resilient mm. you need that uh, I had that so much that I was like, why should I have the other side? And I was like telling myself, I don't need it. It's not going to help me. But lately, like I started dancing again and that creative aspect and all that, that nurturing aspect, it helped me balance everything out and it actually made me feel better. And you know, these kinds of things, like exactly at Theology of Body where I tell you, your body, your soul, yeah. you need to feed both. TOB the- is cool because it, it basically move not move la but it it there's a misconception in the church la misconception is that sex is bad yes and the theobi kind of like said like i think people don't understand what the church teachings on sexuality is theobi said like look there's a difference between abstinence and chastity abstinence yes. is saying no you know no, no mm-hmm. to sex 
Chastity is saying yes to sex in the most fullest form. Yes. Like T.O.B. says like sex is, uh, 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 it's, it's spiritual and it's powerful, but it's so easily abused. And so we want to put it in the right context. You know, like when it comes to dating, we date, right? We do incremental steps. Yes. Uh, it's like, it's like a shadowing of a full-time relationship, but a little bit less. So for example, with dating, um, you can, uh, the commitment is there, but it's not a long time, a full forever mm-hmm. commitment. You can break up. Um, in terms of talking to the person, it's not like you're going to talk to the person every day like you would in a, a, a husband and a wife. But, yeah, of course. But you're talking more than normal. Yes. Everything is incrementally a little bit higher to kind of like test the waters and see whether you're ready for more than that. Yes. But then with sex, it's not that. <laughs> with sex, we True. go to the ultimate extreme, you know. So, TOB says like, look, we want you to understand that there's a time and place for everything and we do, just don't want you to abuse and it would not only hurt you, you might potentially hurt other people which is what which we is see. Very true. Which is what we see, for example, with the Me Too movement. We mm. see people, last time it, used, it just used to be love. As long as it's love, as, as long as it's consensual, sorry. But now we realize that, no, that's, that's not enough. You need to think about the other person. Sometimes it's, because sometimes you have to go, like from my experience, sometimes you do have to make the mistakes in order to understand. Like, like we do learn about, like, you know, theology of the body, all these things, those aspects of the church. And sometimes as teenagers, um, you know, we are rebellious. You, you, we, are, you, we, we will do whatever we fuck. You will never, you will never, uh, you can talk as much theory as you want. But until you go through it, then only you'll really understand that's, it. That's la. why I would say like once, sad to say, sometimes we have to go through it. Yeah, and definitely. after I went through all that, I started to realize, I was like, there is a reason why we were taught that. Yeah. It's because it is like, it is as sacred as what God intended it to be to combine, uh, to join two people together. I, I, I and don't know. it's I, like, you until you really understand it, you will still think it is what it is. But it's actually not. It's so much more than that. It's not just two physical beings. It's your soul, your energy. Okay, like if you talk about like, you know, the what a oh, lot holistic rasta. Well, what holistic was it called? Those rasta? people who like to talk about energies and stuff like that. Those like uh, gurus. Uh, <laughs> hippies. Hippies. Uh, there we go. That's the term I was fine. Yeah. Okay. So like those hippies <laughs> talking about energy and stuff like that. Sure. It's it's similar to what we believe in spiritual energy. There is energies when you connect with someone, or even on a friendship level. There is energy exchange. Yeah. Uh, the people you surround yourself with, there's gonna be energy exchange. It's a sixth sense, and you yeah, will absorb I, everything. I would call that like bonding, like pair bonding, like. I mean, you can that, have. That's the way of saying it, yeah. but you for some people you feel it more like we, we imprint, we yeah, imprint, we course. bond, and we build yeah emotional attachments that you know, are supposed to serve a function. Like, friendship is basically us trying to, uh, evolutionary, it's to keep a community together. Yes. Or even uh, m- husband and wife, men and women, that sort of bond, it's supposed to like sustain you like, like even when uh, you don't love that person, for example, you still feel attached to that yes, person. Yes, of course. So, sometimes you don't love that person but you still find it so difficult, you find it difficult to leave that person because it's not, that's not love, that's an attachment mm. but it has a function. Yes. But it could also be abused. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, sounds, it sounds like you had a really bad breakup. Is that too personal a question? No, not really. Because I've always been the kind of person that... So I've realized that I do have a say in a lot of things in a sense where when I say something on social media, a lot of people do listen. Mm. And that gives me a lot. I never... Actually, I never like to accept that fact. Because mm. I don't like to admit that I do have influence or why I say people do listen. But I have to accept it that wherever I say on social media, there will be people who are listening mm. and people of all ages and all that. And so I've tried to be more responsible with what I say. But I'm also me and I'm the kind of person who will tell it as it is. And I would like to inspire other people from my stories because I know people are very shy about a lot of life experiences and stuff like that. So I would say, yes, um, I did go through a bad breakup, but it wasn't supremely bad in a way. It was just that um, we had a lot of things, a lot of troubles, and we actually, thankfully, I, I actually learned a lot from it because it was the longest relationship I've ever had. How many years? Three. Oh. Two to three years. And even in then, there was the, you know, when you're young, kind of like break up, come back together. Sure. That sort of thing. So yeah. it was a lot of things, but we both learned a lot. Mm. He was much older than me. He was like five years older than me. And I met him when I was like 19. Mm. 
Yeah, so we dated from like 19, I'm 22. And... Oh, so this was recent? Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah, and... But it taught me a lot in the sense where not only in relationships, uh, about each person and all that, but really like, talk about the sexual aspect of things that you're talking about, why God made it such a way that it is only for two people to join together. That relationship really taught me and made me realize like, when you love someone, uh, that that sexual action, sex, is something for you to get more intimate and closer with someone. Mm. And that one, it is like, it, when you have that, because that's what God wanted. When two people love each other so much, they want to get so close to each other. Mm. And that was what it, He intended it to be. When you have that, it, it's a whole different level. And that's when I really understood. I was like, wow. So this is what God, that's why He said this. This is why He said, get married because that's when you know you want to spend the rest of your life with someone. Mm. And that's when you really want to get closer to someone. That was when I kind of understood like, okay, so this is why it was created as such. I didn't see it as, why is the church like telling us not, you know, it's my body, why not? But I understood it was because he was trying to protect us mm. from all these Even things. Even in a secular level, I would say that when we talk about sex, it's very, um, we, 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 it's, it, it, it's described as very mechanical. Yes. Uh, we don't really procreation. Tr- uh, yeah, and not only that, it's like uh, something you do like for fun, like running or exercising, yeah. or, you know, <laughs> whatever. But I think uh, part, we missed a part of the communication, which is we have to understand that there is a hormonal uh, bonding thing going on. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, it, it does happen, and people need to be careful because when you have sex with people, um, you open up, you open yourself up to a lot of uh, emotional hurt. So and negative energies. If like the person I, is harboring a lot of negative energy. Yeah, I was listening to Joe Rogan the other day. This is like Joe Rogan, okay? Was, yeah, nah, 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 nah. Joe Rogan. <laughs> okay, I'll find a way to bring Joe Rogan into this. <laughs> but he was talking to uh, the comedian Nikki Nikki Glazer, mm-hmm. um, and he was basically saying like, uh, he in he is prime when he was sexually active. He said there were girls who would tell him like, you know, this is just for fun. This is just for fun. Mm-hmm. You know, and he said he would believe them and he would hook up with them and then realize, oh, okay, no, it's not just for fun. They 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 wanted more after that. You know, and then he he said like now looking back, he kind of realized like, yeah, with girls, it is actually a little bit different. You know, as much as you want to be as modern and open as you want, but he in his experience with girls, they do emotionally attach a lot faster and harder. Mm-hmm. Right? And so when we talk about sex, people need to know this. You need to know when you have sex, as much as you want to make it mechanical, it's just for fun. But you're, there is an emotional aspect to it as mm. much as you want to detach it and make it just a Definitely. purely physical thing. I think it's because people kind of like, again, I learned this in Theology of the Body and only lately that I actually start to realize the, the truth in it is that… This can become like, we should like Catholic Church. <laughs> <We> should, <laughs> <laughs> this podcast, we will just… <laughs> you know, we'll go on Reddit. We will go on Reddit. <laughs> we just go to the Catholic forums. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I'll get so much shit if that happens. I'll never see this in in front of my any of my Catholic teachers. Because I think they'll smack me like what Why? happened. Why? I think you think… No, like because like some, some very reserved. And I'm not the kind of… I'm not very reserved. I will talk about anything that I see fit and is what I think people should know. No, I think your, your conversation is yeah. really relevant. And… Mm. Wait, what was I saying again? Uh, <laughs> you, you said T.O.B. one more time. Yes, I know. Uh, wait, what was it again? We oh dear Lord. Joe, we, we were talking about Joe Rogan. A breakup. Emotional, the emotional aspect. Yes. So I think a lot of people, what they thing is that they kind of, how you say, make cheap, they make sex cheap. Mm. So, God made, like, in the sense, okay, non-religious, whatever it is. Because uh, I know some people who listen maybe are not very religious. And it was created, not, yes, it can procreate. But it was because of a love from two people that procreation could happen mm. and can happen. Mm. And from there, there is this Sex is like here. Like it should be put on a pedestal. It is yeah. something that is really high up there in religion's term would be sacred. Yeah. But people have made it cheap. No, no, that I, I, it is I, I something that you can… A, a better word maybe that won't cheap. trigger so many people yeah. is it's been commercialized a lot. Just like how we were talking about uh, sports and we were talking yeah, about yeah, the entertainment. Com- or we were talking about the, you know, the violin. And you know, people play the thing and then people go crazy. We've commercialized sex a lot. I, I do agree with this because like… And so I, the, the I, nuance of sex is lost. I do understand this because I'm also like… 
I'm kind of like both where I understand these things because I'm going through like I'm learning all these things. But also I don't, I'm not going to say I judge anyone because I've been there. I've done, I've done photo shoots that essentially I'm like, it, it, uh, boudoir photo shoots. I've done that before. Yeah. I've done all these things because I, I do like, I do kind of like to, how you say, empower women in some senses in a way that um, it is okay that you are a sexual person. Like sure. you have desires Definitely. because society has suppressed females from yeah. feeling like if you have desires, it is wrong. It is yeah. not right. But for guys, it's okay. Mm. And I like to kind of talk about it sometimes and it can be a bit controversial compared to my religion and all this. But I, I believe in it so much because um, you, you are a person. You are a being. You have your desires. You have your sexuality as a female. And it's okay for you to want to bring that out. It's okay for you to want to explore that side of you. You should not be demonized for it. Like, yeah, you have to go through your experiences and all that. But what I didn't like was that women are so much more demonized than men in, in all these kinds of things. And yeah. that was what I didn't like about it. And hence why, like, for me, it was like, it's okay for me to feel like it's okay. Why is it wrong for me to be so confident with myself? Why is it when uh, women want to talk about, like, you know, um, like, you know, like, boudoir? I did, I did one. And honestly, as weird as it sounds, it's very, like, empowering for a woman. Imagine you've been shut down so much, demonized, all these kinds of things. And then when you see yourself in that light, you actually love yourself so much more. Mm-mm-mm. So, yeah, definitely I agree. I like think a... I think we we can empower women or even men to embrace their sexuality, but we can push back on the commercialization of sex. Like. Of course, but then again, if you talk about like, you know, you talk about like money. Mm. Okay, if you talk about like just business, whatnot. It's sad to say, sex sells. Definitely, like most things, like flashy sells. Yeah, yeah, flashy. Like you're talking about the violin. Yeah, <laughs> the flashy, flashy stuff itself. I, I, fighting. I wanted to ask you because you 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 have all these sort of weird slash negative experiences with men, right? But then at the same time, you seem to have all these positive experiences mm. with men. You mentioned many times your dad, your brother, uh, these my this, coaches, your coaches, and yeah. these really seems like good men, right? Mm. In your life, how do you reconcile the two? You know, it took me a long time and. Um, you know when you're a teenager when you you know you get heartbreak or all these kinds of things even the recent one or so I think like it's more of maturity you come to realize that that small poten- that small percentage of people doesn't mean that everyone around the world is like that mm. so it's more like if one person does me wrong it does not mean that everybody is like that mm. it's just that that person was a piece of shit and mm. <laughs> doesn't mean that all men are bad mm. like even my last relationship, yes, we did strain a lot, both parties, lack of communication, you know, all those stuff, sort of things. Distrust, all these kinds of things, uh, disloyalty, whatever it is. But even from that, I learned a lot of positive things where for the first time, I learned what it was to love someone fully, every aspect of them, even from their past, their present, future, what it was to really be in love for the first time. So, you know, it's that kind of thing where I feel like you kind of learn to see the positive in things. Mm. When bad things happen to you, yes, it's really bad. You know, you get all these negative things, uh, people commenting about you and like that. But you can either take it and see the positive side of it or like l- learn from it or you can just like, not say play victim, but feel like you're being attacked. Because mm. they can say whatever they want, but it's your reaction that, you know, um, your reaction that kind of is how you're going to take it. I believe you have, you have control over your own body, your own mind, your reactions. And I think it's really based because because um, my dad, because the way he grew up, he was always there for me, no matter what. Um, even now, he was always there even when I thought I didn't need him. Mm. And when I did, he was 100% there. When I woke up at 2am in the morning, couldn't sleep, he was the first person I found. And because of that, even with the bad experiences Two, with… 2M couldn't sleep because of… Like whatever it is, uh, anxiety mm. or like, um, you know, heartbreak. You, you're just crying, you can't sleep. Mm. Or, or like existential crisis. Mm. Yeah, I had that when I was like 20, 21. Mm. And like, I woke like my dad up. I was like… We have that on a few occasions. Yeah. <laughs> Once in a while. Yeah. Once in a while. <laughs> and 
he was always there and it made me give me perspective in a sense where how how would your dad comfort you? He just talk to me. Mm. And then we just speak or sometimes he'll just speak and I'll just stay calm. He'll ask me what's going on in my mind. You know, all these kinds of things. And because I feel like I had such a strong father figure mm. that even when I was mistreated badly by other men or men who, you know, thought they had rights to say all these kinds of mean things, um, I knew that not everybody was like that. You already because, had a working framework. Because I had my dad and I was like, no, if my father is this kind of person and... I saw how he treated my mom. Mm. He loves her so much. Like you can see it in his actions, not only his words. And I grew up watching my dad treat my mom that way. And I was like, if there's a man like this in the world, there's not there's no way there's only one man like this in the world. Mm. There's definitely more. And I got lucky. I got to meet my professor and I see how he treats his wife mm. with so much love, with so much respect. Mm-hmm. And that even that like even all the bad experiences you see that and you're like there's hope that there are men like that out there and then I see my brother being from well because he's younger because he's gonna be immature sometimes <laughs> with his girlfriend and sometimes he is do you guys fight my brother you and, and I your, yeah like as in like when you were younger did you guys fight a lot yeah but it got less when he got older do you guys fight now not really <laughs> not as do you much. have a spa yeah, yeah, we do. But it's for fun. So we actually start laughing. Uh-huh. Our coach just leads us be and just let us laugh and uh-huh. hit each other. And I see my brother also growing from that, from being... Because you're... With your boy, you're going to be a teenager, you're going to be young, you're going to be foolish, whatever it is. And I see him grow so much. Like he's only 21. He's going to be 21 next month. Mm. And he's grown so much. And you can see that when... When like uh, guys, boys, men realize a lot of things and they take action like my brother 21 years old is the most open-minded and the most mature guy i've ever met when i was 21 last year because only a year apart when i was at that age i've never met anyone like that very rarely and he self-actualizes so much he's like why do i do this why do i do that why did i do that and he takes responsibility for all his actions when he hurts his girlfriend even in the beginning, he, you know, he did not have to deal with it. And now he's like, I accept that I have hurt you even though I intentionally did not intend to do it. And I apologize. And he genuinely like does it. And, cause, uh, and he communicates with her. He's like, I don't like it when you do this. You know, there's, I see him with his girlfriend. Yes, you're going to argue. But there is a communication. There is him learning from his mistakes as well. And actually like trying. And I'm like, if this 21-year-old boy can self-actualize at that age, you can't tell me there's more people out there as well. Mm. So having all these people around me just makes me think like, yes, there are going to be bad apples in the world, but there's also good people in this world. You just need to look for them. Jeremy, I, you, I think you need to help me out here because in my mind, I suddenly was considering how it seems like the more, I don't know, intellectual slash woke community has more you know, weird kind of like, <laughs> you know, they, like Me Too movement. You know, it, it seems to be hitting like that sort of uh, the academia, the sort of like, you know, really um, well-read. You know, you're talking about your umake, umapagans and all, all, you know, this sort of, like really, you would consider them really well-read, really, mm-hmm. you know, knowledgeable. Yeah. But they seem to be doing all these like really stupid kind of things. <laughs> but then you have like a really masculine sort of environment, uh, you know, like a, a, a MMA gym, for example. And then you have all these sort of like, you know, seems like healthy masculine uh, figures. Mm-hmm. Is do you, is there a correlation? Is there? Am I generalizing here? What do you think? Uh, really, don't want to downplay your story. Yeah, of course. But I think that I think you rightly point out there are bad apples out there. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's in, pro- any, in any environment. Yeah, it? that's the first premise. So you, if because if you talk about the la- the, the uh, on the on the conceptual level of identity politics, mm. every group has bad apples. Yeah, definitely. So, while I think it is good that you found good role models, I think the mission for feminists is to change the systems that reproduce that kind of hyper-masculine kind of... The system, the, the sort of systems, cultures, and attitudes that reproduce bad apples. Mm. Right? Yes. And that is functional, that's functionally different than saying all men are bad. Yes. Mm. So the liberal, the liberal extreme edge would say that because it's really easy to win 
by saying it on social media. You can just have hot takes, say all men are trash. Yeah. That's what that's an easy way to win. Yeah. So But that's the, not the real issue though. It's, it's not, not all men are bad. It's yeah. just that those bad apples that so happen to sometimes be the ones who speak the loudest mm -hmm. and people hear. Because the ones that speak the loudest are the ones who are gonna hear. But majority of the time it's just more of giving um it's not feminism and all these kinds of things. I would very hard to call myself that because <laughs> it's a very I, I don't fully understand it. So if I don't fully understand it, I'm not mm. gonna say anything because like I call myself a vegan because I know every aspect of it mm. as much as I can. And it's more of equal equality, equity. I wouldn't mm. say equality because no one is created equally. Mm. Male and female are not created equally. Men are physically just stronger. It mm. is facts. There is a reason for that because God has made maybe him naturally a protector. Not, e not maybe not the word equal, but di definitely different. Like. Equity, mm. equity is like giving giving the right um, opportunities to each person, like kind of even out the playing field because mm. everyone's gonna come from a different background. Some people come from a poor background, mm. which means that. They don't get the education that yeah. a richer person is going to get. Yeah. A better education. So, equity is kind of like trying to level the playing field. And it's more, I feel that a lot of women are trying to speak about all these things. Even to help the males. Because you talk about men getting raped. Mm. These things happen. For no sure. one talks about it. No because about it. men are like, oh, men always want it. That's not true. Yeah. It's so not true that men don't always want it. It is mm. still considered rape if you do not consent. Yeah. And if the female rapes you, it is still rape. But if um, a lot of the times, I, I believe you guys have probably gone through this as well. Imagine if you say it to your friends or whatnot. You say like, oh, this girl tried to, this girl raped me. Yeah. But he's like, what are you talking about? Even even if it's not so extreme, let's say uh, we say a, 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 girl, a girl came up to me in the, the bar and she just started making out with me and I pushed her away. Yeah, and that's they, sexual they, harassment. They, it would, it, 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 you would laugh at it. But if you turn the, the role… Exactly. You know, it's something totally and, different. And then it's like sexual harassment for females. But mm. I think I think that's kind of what like feminism is trying to get. It's not mm. all men are trash. It's that we want to have both. Where you know females in poorer countries, they're treated so badly just because they are born female. a female. Like just because of that, they don't get access to a lot of things. Or like… Uh, like Let's say menstrual cycle. You're going to need pads, whatever it is. Yeah. And sometimes you don't get access to that. Mm. So, because of females. And a lot of times, companies, whatever it is, they kind of demonize that aspect of, you know, you can't control the fact that a female is going to have her menstrual cycle every month. And they say, it's a bad thing. Why can't you just go to work? They don't accept that. Even talking about maternity leave. Maternity leave is seen like a bad thing. I don't want to take maternity leave and all these kinds of things. And you have more progressive companies that I know that have paternal leave because yeah. they recognize that fathers should be there during the first few months. And it'll also reduce the, the, the gender pay gap. If you give paternity leave, it would reduce the gender pay gap. Exactly. So why should why should a woman be punished mm. for having a baby? Yeah, for sure. Um, you, you, your dad. Um, mm -hmm. very interesting dude because he's actually military. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've met your dad many, well, not many times, but a few times. And, Definitely. You know, we know each other. Well, I know him. I don't know whether he remembers me. <laughs> but I, I should I, check I, my messages <laughs> later. I told him I was talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, he's ex-military. Yes. Um, and again, I, like I was telling the both of you before we started, you can tell that he is someone that alpha is, male. <laughs> uh, yeah, alpha, but not in a uh, hostile way. Mm -hmm. He's, he, he comes off as he comes off as someone who's very sure of himself, very confident. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, and he seems like a, a nurturer, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Like, uh, I wonder how he, you know, someone who's so con, you know, stereotypically or conventionally male, right? He's very, you know, like you said, alpha male. But then he also somehow exhibits this really uh, nurture, like nurturing paternal yeah. sort of um, um, characteristics. Yeah. I, I wonder what his story is like. Is it just his personality? Was he brought up in a particular way? He been. I would say he brought up in a very interesting. I would even sometimes wonder it's a bit messed up also in my point of view because I grew up with my parents. Mm. So of course my point of view of how parenting should be kind of based on them a bit, and I feel like that's kind of his personality somehow because mm. I do see it a bit in my brother also because my brother is also quite the he gives us a vibe of alpha male also mm. he is like that, but. He is also the sweetest person you ever meet. If you ever 
gain his trust and he loves you a lot, you will see him in a completely different light. Mm. Yes, my brother on the outside, he's like, he will look like he can beat you up. And like, he can. But like, <laughs> he's that, he has the same confidence like my dad. Mm. Exactly the same. But when you get close to them, that's when you really see a different side. So my, it's the same. My brother and my dad are very similar in that sense. And I have no idea how my dad got to be the way he is. I'm just happy he is. <laughs> and he, I think it's more of being so sure of your own masculinity that it, whatever people say, you doesn't care. It's like my brother is the same. He's 21. But I've never met someone who's so sure of his masculinity. His friends make fun of him, like jokingly, or even other people that don't know him make fun of him. He's just like, I know who I am. I know whatever it is. You can call me whatever you want. But I know what I am, who I am. Whatever you say doesn't faze me. Like sometimes his girlfriend is like, I want to paint your nails. Mm. And he's just like, sure. Because he makes her happy. And he doesn't feel like, oh, it's immasculine for me to hold my girlfriend's hand back. Mm. Or it's, it's to, to let my girlfriend paint my nails because mm. she wants to. It's like, he makes her happy. I love her. And if other people make fun of him, he's just like, so what? Yeah, make, making fun of people for holding a girlfriend's hand back is quite common. I've been part of that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah indeed, I've but been part of it. you have to be like really confident in <laughs> to yourself. Deal with it, like, and yeah. my dad is like that too. And I always ask him sometimes. I'm like, why are you doing so much for my mom? Like you do all these things, aren't you sometimes worried about what people say? And you know, you know, common teenager questions that you he ask your parents. He can shoot a gun. You know, mm. Yeah, he can. Sh- oh, he can shoot a gun. <laughs> he can shoot a gun. He, can shoot. he taught us all how to mm. shoot a crossbow and guns too. Damn. Sorry. And um, he his what he told me was. I love your mother very much and I will do anything for her. Mm. And why does it matter what other people say? Because I don't really care about them. The person that I care about is your mom, like my wife. She's the most important person to me in the world. It doesn't matter what other people say yeah. because I want to show my love for her. And of course, because he's so secure of himself, he doesn't care. He holds my mother's back. He would take my mom out when she's not working and she, he will wait for her. He will wait for her. <laughs> like, I'm like, he will take, drive her to a hiking spot, uh. let her hike, and it'll be maybe two, three hours. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll wait. He'll go around, do his own thing. Yeah. And when my mom is done, call him, and he'll be there. And I asked my mom and my dad, I'm like, because they've been married for what? I'm 22. So 27 years. Mm. And I'm like, mom, how is it that you and dad, because they're both very opposites, polar opposites. Mm. Freaking polar opposites. And I'm like, she's like, she told me once, I think after my breakup or something like that, she told me, you know your dad is the, she, she does, she's not the feelings kind of person. Yeah. She's the <laughs> typical Asian mom, yeah. tiger mom. So she doesn't talk about feelings. And she told me, you know your dad, no matter what, I know he will always be there. Mm. Even if sometimes I can be unbearable <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and you know, like a temper and all that. Because my mom sometimes has a temper. And he said, I know that no matter what, that your father is always going to be there for me. That even though I, I can be a bit temperamental, he will always be there. He's always there to talk to me. He's always there for me. Like, I have no doubt in my mind that if I need him, he's going to be there. Mm. And I was like, wow, after 27 years? And she still has that same feelings for him. And I asked my dad too. I was like, why is it that you, you know, you wait for mom all the time. You help her with so many things. You have your stuff to do. You have your stuff to do. But you will make time for her all the time. I was like, because I want to spend every second with her if I can. My, if I'm free, if she's not working and I'm not working, I want to spend time with her because she's the person I love most in the world. And I see it with us too. He will make time for my brother and I when we're going through troubles and everything. Like, sometimes he has work. The next day, like, he has like part-time jobs, right? And he sometimes has to do uh, recce or whatnot. And maybe he has to wake up at 7, 8 a.m. He'll wake up at 2, 3 a.m. just because my brother and I are having issues mm. and talk to us until we fall asleep. Mm. And he will always put his family first. I think for him, he says like, because what he said was, I know my priorities. Mm. My priority is my family is first. And when you have, the, when he had that, it's like, it, it really puts into perspective a lot of things. Because I did like a DNA method with Chris Cyborg and Eric Farrow. Chris Cyborg is a 
legend in MMA. And they were talking about all these things. When you know your roles and your priorities, when you already prioritize what is what first, because each person has a lot of roles. You are a son, you are a, you are a son, you, you, your job, you are a lawyer, you are, you know, whatever it is, here you are a host. Mm. And then to your friends, maybe you are someone that they trust. So you have so many roles in your life. It is a fact. But which role comes first depends on what your priority is. Mm. is your, does your family come first? Does your job come first? Then when you have that and you're sure and you're like, number one is family, number two is work, number three, whatever it is, when it comes to making decisions, it's so much easier because you know, Family first. So, my family needs me, I'm going to be there. Mm. You know, that sort of thing. I feel like he, he's, he's reached to that point where he's so sure he has his priorities, right? But don't get me wrong, my dad is also someone who uh, thinks a lot, mm. which is why I would say 80% of my personality actually comes from him. Mm. 80% comes from him. He thinks a lot. He, he, pray, he prays so much because he thinks so much. And... He's the only person I've ever met that truly I've seen so much faith in one person. Mm. Like, even the toughest times where he can't sleep, he wakes up and prays. And I'm like, how are you doing this? Mm. Like, I don't, I don't understand. I still don't understand. But he has so much faith that no matter what happens, like, things will work out and all these kinds of things. And I feel like that is because of that and the love he feels like because he's so, so spiritual with love from God that he feels that it translates to dealing with us as well, that he's so patient. He always seeks to understand us. Even if I'm being a piece of shit, <laughs> <laughs> he will seek to understand where I'm coming from. Yes, he will scold me first and then mm. he'll be like, why are you acting like this? What is going on? What parent says that? My mom scolds me and then leaves. <laughs> and then my dad is like, what's going on? Why are you why are you talking like this? Why are you saying all these things? What's going on with you? Like, yeah. he seeks to understand. And then, having that going up, is like, okay, I don't know why. And it makes us self-realize, like, like, I really don't know why I'm like this. Like, mm. I've just been feeling like this. And then, you know, he starts to break down what the real issue is. And then we're like, we come to an actual conclusion where this is the real problem. And then from there, I learned. My brother and I learned, like, okay, Sometimes you feel like this. This might not be the main issue. The main issue could actually be stemming from this. Mm. And you need to deal with that first before, you know, you just burst or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, sounds like a great dude though. Yes. And, and I guess a very good example of, a, like you said, like a, a healthy male role model for you. Mm. That sort of shaped your, your worldview. Hopefully, we can have more men like that out there. because uh, I definitely believe so. Hopefully, yeah. Because I think lately in the spotlight has been... Sort of this the bad example. <laughs> bad yes, examples. Very the, true. the good ones are usually quiet because there's nothing to talk about. Um, <laughs> drama, make, gossip. Yeah, drama, yeah. gossip, entertainment. Um, we are way past time, Colin. Oh, yes. <laughs> but it's all right. Uh, we spoke about a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of stuff. And I think we definitely can have you for a round two because I don't think we've even covered the, the, the surface. Yay. Uh, <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. Do you want to plug your stuff? What's that mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your social, where, where oh. can they? I mean, do you, do you have like a crowdfunding? Because I know you were crowdfunding <laughs> before. Oh, that was for my world championships. And then some a very nice private sponsor actually sponsored my mine and my coach's flights. Oh, that's nice. nice. Yeah, she yeah. came out of nowhere and was just like, I don't want to be known. Uh, I just want to help mm. you get where you need to be. Which country did you just go to? Bahrain. No, you, you went to Bahrain. Mm. Uh, how was the tournament? It was good. I ended up coming, not the result that I wanted, but I came up to bronze medal in the World Championships. Oh, great. So, it reached the goal of the president, which is to actually, for the first time, for Malaysia to actually bring home a medal from that international event because no Malaysian has ever brought back a medal at that event. Nice. So, he reached his quota. I want to become a world champion. <laughs> so, You're still young. it's okay. But yeah, that was a really good tournament. I really learned a lot. It was my first loss. Mm. So that loss was the most heartbreaking I've ever felt. Mm. Most heartbreak I've ever felt. Mm. I cried for like two days straight. I didn't Damn. eat for two days. Mm -hmm. And But that taught me so much. That tournament taught me so much. I met so many amazing athletes from around the world. 
and you know had a good time i learned a lot and from now like that experience of like loss mm. actually like taught me a lot and gave me more fire actually like you know what next time i'm going to come back and come back harder <laughs> nice yeah. nice so where okay so you don't have crowdfunding but uh, where can people follow you on your oh um you can follow me on instagram which is colleen augustine mma and you can follow me on twitter too it will literally just be my name colleen i think it's underscore augustine mm-hmm. i think that's about it and if you want to Find me lifting weights will be in union. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we can end with a weird, I don't know, some sort of recommendation, but MMA themed. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you can mention like what? where where would where would be good places to train for people oh. yeah. who are interested to try. There uh, is for newbies, so many. where's a good spot for them to check out? I would okay. I'll come, I'm going to be biased as hell, but <laughs> my coaches honestly are the best. And you are at? Um, currently in Monarchy. Bangsa. But the only reason, oh no, I go to all the gyms. I bounce around okay. depending where my coaches are. So okay. for me, I am kind of like following my coaches wherever they go. Okay. So my Muay Thai coach just left. So wherever he is, I'm going to be there also. Okay. So I'm there because my grappling, my wrestling and jujitsu coach are there. So my friends are teaching the Muay Thai class. So it's a good class to go to as well. <laughs> and honestly, the coaches are amazing. So if you want to learn jiu-jitsu, do come train under Professor Bruninho in Monarchy. Right now, he's going to be there. You know, I always believe that take, don't take things for granted because I don't know how long he's going to be there as well. So yeah, especially if you, if you feel uncomfortable, yes, do come. We have 80 over people who do jiu-jitsu and come from wide range of ages, from even 50 plus people, 50 years old, mothers, whatever it is, fathers, people who are old, retired, they train jujitsu. People from as young as kids, as young as five, seven years old, also learning jujitsu under mm. my professor. And especially like females, if you feel uncomfortable training with men, we have 20, 30 jujitsu girls. Mm. And even if you want to do wrestling, I mean, we have a shit ton of girls also. Like, Come, join, train. The environment is just wonderful because of the coaches. If you want to, you know, improve yourself, whatever it is, you want to learn a lot, come. Nice. Jeremy, any, you watch these MMA interviews. Any interviews really, really <laughs> good, solid interview that you want to recommend? I mean, the Firas Zahabi mm-hmm. interviews. He, this guy coached George St. Pierre for oh. like, yeah. This, he was a philosophy major. So his three-hour interview <laughs> with Joe Rogan… <laughs> Was really interesting. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yeah. My recommendation was actually just Joe Rogan, but you've already kind of hijacked my job. <laughs> I, I think you can you maybe you guys want to check out the Joe Rogan and uh Nikki Glazer one. It was pretty good. I mean they spoke about a lot of things like mm. mental health and uh Ooh, also wow. about sex and uh also about um he saw Joe Rogan's kind of interest in, you know, just not just DMT. N- <laughs> not DMT. <laughs> not just uh Jiu Jitsu, but also in just his holistic sort of lifestyle, why he likes to work out and things like that. So, yeah, that was a good... I, I really enjoyed that one. So, yeah. Joe Rogan, please do uh, tag, have us tag, on. Tag, tag, tag. Please <laughs> do have us on. We're we, we, we your, your biggest fans. It's not, it's not about the numbers. It's your <laughs> biggest fans. <laughs> okay, How tag. many mentions you should do a count? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need to have like a Joe Rogan counter. <laughs> This one will be quite a lot. <laughs> um, thank you so much again for coming. Thank you so um, much for really, having me. Yeah, we really appreciate you. And uh, Jeremy, as always, it's a pleasure. And we are done. Sense it. Sense it.